All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the school committee meeting of February 9th, 2022. This meeting is being broadcast on WHCA and is also being recorded. As we start every meeting, if you could please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we'll start with, uh, since we have, uh, well, we'll start with public comment. Do we have any public comment? We'll open that up. No? Okay. okay then you're good. Great. Then we will move right into the Student Advisory Committee who is joining us tonight for their first uh, presentation and report. Do you want to introduce them? Sure. Uh, it's up to you. you yeah. So. So welcome, you guys. Congratulations on being elected. I'd just like to introduce you and wave your hand once uh, I call your name. Anna Flynn, is, and she was uh, selected as chair by her peers. Celia Goyette, Emma McKeon, Riley Getchell, and Noah Roberts. So they will be your student advisory council through June. And then hopefully, if things go well, we will have some returnees uh, once they do re-elections. And I know we will have a few folks that, uh, that graduate, so they're off to a different place next year to be leaders. Um, we had a, just to let the committee know, um, Ms. Byers and I met, uh, the students and I were in person and Ms. Byers was live on Zoom. And we talked about the agenda the other day, their role, and I think they're excited to be here today uh, in the next coming months to share their thoughts about school and what we do in our district. So, open it up. Should we introduce ourselves? Yeah, yeah, and that was one of the things we actually yeah. talked about, too, so. You want to introduce us? I'd be happy to yeah. start, yeah. Hello, uh, Chris Griffin, Vice Chair, School Committee, Whitman Resident. Uh, Beth Stafford, uh, Whitman Resident. Michael Jones, School Committee, Hanson. Jeff Simonak, Superintendent. Chris Howard, School Committee, from Hanson. Hillary Nick. David Forth from Anton uh, Whitman. John Byers, Whitman. Michelle Bujala, Hansen. Stephen Boyce uh, from Whitman. And then on the phone, we have Fred. Fred? Fred Small, Whitman. Great. <laughs> All right. So I think we intended this to be kind of free flowing and give you an opportunity to kind of share wherever you wanted to go. So we'll turn it over to you and you know, or turn it over to John. <coughs> she'll, she'll get us going. Sure. So th in our Zoom, the students did ask, you know, what do we say? Of course, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff and I said, well, we're not here to tell you what to say. But I think that question was more around, like, what's, what's happening here? And I said, you know, you are the voice of the student body. So you're more than welcome to share your feelings about school. If you have questions about school, um, maybe the first meeting now would be a great introduction. So feel free to share something about yourself even if you want to go back to your grade school or middle school or just so we can get to know you as students so feel comfortable that way and then i know you'll come back in april and maybe if you you know want to stay and listen to the meeting it will formulate more questions you might have so the more you listen sometimes you form more questions <coughs> and you know we bless you. bless you thank you and as committee members we ask a lot of questions ourselves so the old adage is never a silly question. So please, if you want to just someone to say to someone, could you explain that? Could you repeat that? I didn't hear that well. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I'm just going to add, you know, thinking back to when I first joined the committee, um, I don't think I spoke, you know, a couple words for the first several. I, I was all listening, you know. And, 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 um, so don't feel pressured to speak, but you know what I mean? We'd all love to hear from right. you. Okay. But uh, it's understandable. I know. I just don't know what I mean. Little, okay. Yeah. So maybe for those of you who are seniors, maybe you want to share what your, your career path or your inspiration is going on from here. So um, one at a time, if you wouldn't mind, up to the microphone or <laughs> want to get started. <laughs> Do you mind just going yeah, up to the, the mic? Because we are recording. <coughs> that, way the people, Thanks, that way the people at home can hear you as well. Um, my name is Riley Getchell. I'm a junior here at Whitman Hanson. Um, I've actually spoken at one of these school committee meetings before, last June, right after plastic and polystyrene containers were banned in Whitman. Um, I'm really glad that I com could come back here. Um, in my time at Whitman Hanson, I've had a very positive experience being involved in a lot of different clubs. 
And I think this year it's been a bit of an adjustment, but I think it's going pretty well getting back to almost normal. So, thanks. I'm Celia Goyette, and I'm a senior here at Whitman Hanson. And I love Whitman Hanson. It has a lot of great opportunities for students to get involved. And personally, I started a magazine at this school. It's called The What Magazine. And it's just a fun pop culture, like school information magazine. And currently, we have 40 to 50 members that submit for us every month. And we print through the school and distribute through the school. And we get really good feedback on it from students. Um, hi, my name is Anna Flynn. I've spoken at these meetings before. I really like it because I like to use my voice. <laughs> I actually have my own blog that I write on because I like um, listening to people's opinions and writing about it and hearing from my peers. I also do um, three seasons of sports and a bunch of clubs. I love Wolfen Hansen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Noah Roberts. I'm from Hanson and I'm a junior. And my experience with Women Hanson, uh, because I'm a junior, the first two years were a little bit off because of COVID. But since coming back this year, I've noticed like such a change of kind of the culture of the school in general. And I think everybody, all the students, have really realized that like things aren't as they really have been. And I'm looking to be able to reach out to the students and get their opinions on what could be changed to kind of bring school back to the lively culture it was. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emma McKeon. I'm a sophomore at Whitman Hanson and over the last about two years, I mean, it's been very different from a lot of school, but I've tried to be involved as much as I can and it's been really great and I'm just really excited for the next two years. Great. Thank you. Can, can I ask a question? So, so you mentioned the, the magazine. How'd that start? How'd you get that, Mike, please. How'd that start? Because that's something that I'm sure you brought that to somebody's attention, right? Yeah, definitely. It was just like a crazy idea I had one day in school and I talked to some friends about it and see, like saw if they were interested and all of them seemed to be really interested in into like submitting and creating it. So we actually went to Dr. Jones, our principal, and we brought the idea to him and he helped us like create it, grab some advisors for it and really get the club up and running. And we have like a Google Classroom set up like you would any other class. So that's a great way to communicate with other students and anyone can join. The Google Classroom code is posted and we put announcements on the school news to advertise for it. And a lot of people have gotten involved lately, which is really nice. That's awesome. Great. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think you keep copies right outside the office, right? In the box. So maybe if anyone wants to pick up a copy. Great. So is there anything that you wanted to share with us in terms of questions? And it's okay. Like to I think Don's point this my experience has always shown that the best way to get through some of these things is an organic experience. I think when you try and force stuff, it doesn't work. So I think having you here to listen, understand, support, um, share is great. If there are things that you want to share with us, we'd love to have it. And if you're not ready to do that now and you want to kind of save some of that for future meetings, that's fine too. So, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Um, I know that a lot of students have been asking this and I also have the same question. We just got like report cards, but they're like quarter two grades. Um, are we going to get like a semester grade? Because like I know Cece and I were both seniors and we have to send like our mid-year grades off to colleges. Are we going to get like an actual semester one report card that has like the averages? Because on my quarter two report card, all I see is like the hardcore quarter two grades, not like anything added from my quarter one grade. That's a great question. I'm going to text this principal right now, and you'll have an answer tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you. I heard there was something about like February 10th. I wasn't okay. sure if that was like. Usually, usually, you will get your semester combined. So you'll have your quarter, your quarter, and then there's a semester grade that folks need to send off to their, their, their schools. Okay, so thank usually you. Usually that happens. But I'll find out for you. You'll, you'll know tomorrow, Anna. Anyone else? It's really hard when you're a senior waiting for those yep. grades. Yeah. That's a so. fun process, I'm sure, yeah. applying for schools. Yeah. 
So I know this is like very recent news and we'll probably discuss it later today, but during the school today, everybody seemed to be talking about this new mask mandate and what everything is going to do with this. Some people are very for uh, anti or like not having to wear masks any anymore. Some people feel as if we should still wear masks. So I just wanted to know like how this council kind of has an influence on that and maybe what you guys were leaning towards? So I'm gonna cover that in my COVID report today, just about the, the governor's announcement and the commissioner's announcement and make some recommendations to the committee going forward based on the, on the DESE policies and the uh, Mass Department of Public Health policies in their recommendations. So stay tuned for, for another 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and folks, when you're up there, speak up a little bit. And Mr. Small's having some difficulty hearing. So maybe use the, there's two mics there. The mic attached to the, to the podium is for TV. The other mic illuminates your voice a little bit. Um, so I know that in the past two years, or maybe it was just last year and this year, we've had free lunch at our school. And I've noticed that it's great for a lot of students who struggled to bring lunch but still couldn't afford to get to buy lunch every day and didn't qualify for free lunch. So it's a great resource for students this year. I was wondering if the school committee or the state chose whether to keep that or what the plans are for next year as about as to lunch. So right now that's a federal government initiative and, and actually great question because I have my director of food services in the second row back there. <laughs> so Nadine, what's the plan for next year? Are we looking at free from the Fed? Wow, huh. excellent. I'm, pretty loud. Uh, I'm a mind reader today, this is great. <laughs> um, Project Bread, School Nutrition Association, School Nutrition Foundation, other organizations are trying to pass um, free lunches forever. Um, we're supposed to have some more information up and coming. They're still meeting on it. We don't have any answers to that yet. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Good question. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. Anyone else? The caucus. <laughs> Another thing that we wanted to point out was the schedule at school. Um, we always start with like, it goes like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and each day one, one of the days drops. Um, CC and I, we were talking about um, back in 2019, 2020, that school year when we were sophomores, we had the rotating schedule where it rotated at the beginning of the day and the ending of the day and it was like bad egg that was like one of the days it was like bad -E -E -G. that's like the first one that comes to mind and lots of students like preferred that because it was like easier and you didn't have to like wake up every day with the same class and two classes dropped instead of one and like people felt that that was like a little easier we were wondering if like if we could like go back to that or do something more like that but I know Cece and I like won't be here next year, but we think it would be good for all the other students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, I've just gotten similar feedback um, from teachers as well, mm -hmm. like talking about like having kids like after like lunch and gym every day or something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it, I've saw. I've, I've, you guys are asking great questions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts, Joe? I, I do. Like, if yeah. Paul wants to comment first, and I'll. Yeah. I'll Anna, thank you so much for sharing that. And even as a senior, I mean, you just said you won't be here next year. So some seniors would say, well, it's not going to matter to me. But the freshmen and the sophomores don't understand, or they weren't here living that other schedule. So yes. that's why this is wonderful that you're here sharing that experience just to bring it to light to us and to your principal and those decision makers. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So I'll just share some thoughts and, and we, I shared a little with you guys anyway the other day. Um, when I was principal here, we adopted the rotation and it was a morning rotation for committee members and for people at home um, because budgets were tight and sometimes I had to have a part-time person. So I would do a four periods in the morning that would rotate A, B, C, D so that if you're a part-time person, you taught two classes, you would never, you could come in at seven, which was waking up really early, but you would leave by 1030. You would never have to teach a first period class and a last period class. And the afternoon rotated EFG so that you never had the, last, the, the students the last period of the day. We ran into a little bit of an issue because at that point, we remember we had students doing internships. Wow. So I locked period G a little bit 
so that sometimes you did have those last period, but those were the seniors go, had to go out. I couldn't float them around. Pre-COVID or when COVID hit, we kind of went to a six period set schedule. And I think you guys have six now, but they do they rotate or no? They don't rotate, right? One just like drops each day. One just drops. So you have seven classes and one drops, correct? Yeah. Yes. So in that, that schedule that was created prior to, students signed up for seven classes, but would only have five a day, right? Yes. We dropped two. Seven dropped two. So you would have your morning rotation and your afternoon rotation, but there was always a day that you wouldn't have two of your teachers. And sometimes it was great for the students not to have the teachers, and sometimes it's great for the teachers not to have okay. the students. So Dr. Jones is looking at trying to put together an ideal schedule. And if you work in a high school, there's no such animal. You can do a, vari a variation of all, um, but he's soliciting feedback from students and especially students that were here prior to COVID about what to have. There's drawbacks to both because you want to elongate some periods and in that five drop three, we had a 68 minute period. And then we, if you want to put in more courses, sometimes you have to shrink the amount of classroom time that happens. So good feedback. I think, I think the teachers um, are, are giving him some feedback also. I don't know if he's going to roll something out in September. Um, but it's really good feedback to have and, and, and I appreciate it because that's, it's, it worked for us. It took for a while to, to get through it, but it did work at, at, at points. There are some negatives to that also. Um, again, if you want to do a, a rotation or have a, uh, a, a true internship program, you have to lock a period and that doesn't mean for a, a true rotation. So again, good feedback and, and I'm glad he's surveying kids and, and getting some input. Thank you. Do you know, um, just as a follow up to that, um, and I don't have the answer to this, I guess I've never really asked, but how does it work at the middle school level? George, what's the middle school schedule? Is it similar or is it different? It's, it, or Beth, good answer. Beth, right. <laughs> right. That's all right. Mm -hmm. I just can do it. Uh, the middle schools are a rotation, so you have the ability to, um, to change your schedule every day. So, for example, if you're on A day, you might start with, um, the day starts with students in a period of related arts, and then it just rotates completely. Okay. So the, the difference between high school and middle school is that you have a schedule that moves in blocks at a middle school. For example, I need to move all these kids out so a teacher can have a prep, or I need to move all these kids out so the students can go to related arts. So once you have the matrix of filling a schedule really for students to be in front of adults all day, you can then have the ability to mix it up. So the schedule rotates, and what's nice about the middle school schedule is that post-COVID, pre-COVID and post-COVID, is that I'm not with the same students for my four academic majors. Mm -hmm. So in ELA, I might have different students than social studies. I might have different students than math. But then when I go to related arts, I see a whole bunch of different students. Okay. So there's, the concept is, is that you have multiple connections at different times of your life, middle school being the one where you want to make the most connections. So we separate and bring back as many times as we can. Great. Yeah, I mean, I was just, I think it makes sense, right? Feedback-wise, like after lunch, that whatever their class is after lunch. Yep. Yep. It's probably a little bit of a, it's tough. you got to get tough. through it. So yep. that's good feedback. But, you know, the more we can do that throughout the district, probably the better off we are, not just the high school level. Mm -hmm. And that's an important to piggyback on Don's comment, much the same way that, you know, we need your feedback from the seniors because, you know, there's going to be other kids that are being high school and your feedback's invaluable. Make sure you're our representatives to do this. But one of the things that we had talked about when we formed this was you are all high school students. And we really would appreciate, you know, you going back uh, in your thoughts or even getting feedback, whether it's other siblings or friends or whatever, remember, you know, you can help us with feedback, whether it's middle school or elementary school or even pre-K, because we'll, we'll take it all. So thank you for that. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How are um, you all getting information from the entire student body about what to bring us? Have you thought about how you're going to do that, right? Because there's five of you and it's a great that you're all from different eight, no freshmen, right? Just sophomore, junior, seniors. So how are you getting feedback from the entire student body about things that they need? Um, do, do you have any ideas or? <laughs> so I've been fortunate enough to be elected for junior class president. So cool. I have a position where I can help reach through the students. And what we started or just to implement probably about a month ago we put out the Google form, so we just will respond to. With a bunch of different types of questions, whether that be their mental health in the school, what they don't like about the 
schedule or different things like that, which we only we posted that on different social media sites like that our student bot our student class owns, and that got some outreach. It wasn't as many as re responses as we hoped for, but it gave us a good idea when looking at different groups of people and how their feelings are towards the school. Most of the information that we get is just by word of mouth, mm -hmm. either from our different clubs or from our different classes or even from teachers themselves talking about the school. So we want to develop more of an outreach to the students that they'll feel free and comfortable to talk to. And we just need to find a better way to outreach to more people. Great. The Google form is that that was my, so was, I teach in a high school and they, they use a QR code. So just take a picture of a QR code and it opens up to a Google form, which sounds like what you all had going on, which is great. I think that's probably, you know, you're going to hear people complain and they're not going to want to fill out a Google form, as I'm sure you know. So. <laughs> great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, final comment or question before we move on in terms of the agenda? I was just going to ask one thing, tracing back kind of to like the schedule and stuff. I've had a lot of people ask me and just hear different thoughts and things on the like quarter grades now that they're changed from just two semesters down to quarters. I've heard a lot of good things and bad things. I just wanted to know if we're going to continue that. So that's a that's a principal high school decision. Um, and I know there's been different things so to the committee. Um, I think last year, I don't know, when did you switch to a, a hard, instead of a hard stop to a floating stop? Was it last year or the year before? Do you remember? Was it this year? When, so so you, you had a, quarters in the past when we all went to school, like quarter one ended on October 31st. And if you were failing, you got an F and then you had a fresh start November, 30, November 1st. Dr. Jones and, and the high school leadership team kind of extended that a little bit so that if you were failing at, on October 31st, you could still pass the semester. It wasn't a hard stop, it was a progress report. We reverted back to the hard stop, correct? And there's many reasons for that, because kids, the data showed that students didn't take the opportunity to move past that F or that D or that C, they kind of got lost in the wind. So that hard stop and soft stop didn't necessarily change. So they reverted back to the hard stop, which put uh, an end date and kind of a finality on students so that they didn't push things off to the future. I think, I think that's going to stay. I can't tell you for sure. The pilot, that piece that, they, that, that the high school did, there's not a lot of schools that do that in, in the Commonwealth. Um, and it did affect athletics in certain respects. It did affect other things um, around, uh, um, what's the word I'm using, uh, looking for? I got COVID. Eligibility. eligibility, thank you, Ms. Niffin. Eligibility and things like that. So they went back to the hard stop. Uh, and I think that's probably going to continue to be more traditional. So, but the feedback is good. And I hope you give Dr. Jones that feedback because whatever feedback, it, you, pro and con, you kind of can tweak things as you go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Anna. This just like ties back with what Emma said with like the quarter grades. I know that when I was like a sophomore and a freshman, how we had the two semesters and then you had like the progress reports, like you said, but at the ending of the semester, there were like midterms and then at the ending of the year was finals. And I know that you guys took that away because of COVID and then I think it was like people didn't like, I know people were saying like they got rid of them too because people weren't like performing as well on them as we were hoping. But I know back like freshman year, cause I had midterms and finals sophomore year, like I didn't have finals at the end of the year cause of COVID, but I know, but like in that time it was stressful, but like overall, like it kind of like prepares you. Like if I had them now, like if I had midterms and finals, it would prepare me for college when I have midterms and finals. And then there were no quarters. Like when the quarters come, I get like overwhelmed. Like, oh my God, like you have to do this and that. But like in college, if I had the two semesters with the midterms and the finals, like, I don't know, I just feel like the semesters was a better fit, mostly for students that want to go into college after. Okay. Good, good feedback. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on in the agenda. You're welcome to stay, um, but you don't have to, so. Um. I would just ask if you could pull your seats back a little bit, because people are going to be walking up and down to the podium. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, folks. Nice Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So the next item is meeting minutes. So I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of December 22nd, 2021. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those. Ah, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go discussion. <laughs> We're gonna have to roll call anyways. But yes. Go um. Ahead. Oh gosh. Um. Sorry. Don't. Just a clarifying question on the, um, the edit. The first edit. Sorry, I'm going to have to find it. Oh, this is the one you asked me about. Right. Just the, the, the word current year in that. Um... Yeah, so it, we had talked about making sure that we clarified in the minutes that there were kind of three or four takeaways that we had to do. And there was language about the utilization of circuit breaker. And the last section talked about we would use, um, we would basically use that to support the current budget. And I think Don called out uh, the current uh budget in development right would that be the language you wanted to add something like that or the current budget for the upcoming well, year or was it yeah it said current year but i think it, the nature of it was for the the coming budget the the future fiscal year what yep. am i trying to say not yeah the current budget being worked on right yeah um, yeah not this, not so this do you want, right not the budget we're living in right now like as if it was right now it would be local. you know can you don are you what, where in the minutes are you referring to, just so I can have context? Sure. Is it where it says points discussed? I don't know what page it is. Hold on. It looks like page five on mine, but I don't know if that's. Let me pull up meeting minutes. Yeah, because ultimately we just did an amendment. Um, it was. <laughs> Wait, I might even be referring to January 5th, was it? The circuit breaker? No. Is it so the I'm looking at the January 12th and on page five points discussed says um, <coughs> blah, 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 preparing the budget for the upcoming year. And it's talking about. Uh, oh, you're right. But we, OK, so I'm going which, which, to which, hold on this yeah, because. OK. Yeah, okay. We're, yep. we're only voting. I'm sorry, no problem. Hillary. No problem. We're voting on December 22nd, but you're right. It is the January 12th. So, I wanted to clarify. Yeah, no okay. problem. So Thanks. any yeah, no problem. Any additional questions or comments or concerns on December 22nd? OK, we'll do a roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Shell? Yes. Don? Yes. David? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Mike? Yes. Fred? Yes. Beth? Yes. Chris? Yes. OK, great. Unanimous. Uh, okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of January 5th, 2022. So moved. Second. Discussion? Okay. Nope. We're just for sake of, we'll just go the same order. Uh, roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry. Michelle. <laughs> sorry. I'm thinking of the next minute. It's Don. Yes. David? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Fred? Yes. Mike? Yes. Beth? Yes. Chris? Yes. Great. All right, I'd uh, entertain a motion to accept the minutes of January 12th, 2022 as presented. So moved. Second. Discussion, Don? Sure, on the email from Michelle, which came on Sunday, and it just outlined on page five, um, the following was added to be included. So I'll, I'll read, it says, as committee and administration, we are all in agreement that until otherwise voted by the school committee, when preparing the budget for the upcoming year, the expected reimbursement for the present year will be utilized to offset special education expenses in that current budget. So the terminology of in that current budget, I don't disagree with the, the overall purpose and what this says, it just to clarify, in that current budget. So maybe instead of saying in that current budget, in the development of the upcoming budget, is that? Yeah, I think so. Does that work? Could you say in the budget of the next fiscal year? Yes, please, thank you. Sure. <laughs> you wanna make that motion to amend? Me, uh, uh, me? Yeah, because oh. it sounded good. <laughs> I would make the motion to <laughs> amend uh, point number one to say, uh, expected reimbursement for the present year will be utilized to offset special education expenses in the next fiscal year's budget. Okay. Second on that. Great. 
any further discussion on that. Okay, this is just on the amendment. Steve? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Don? Yes. David? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Fred? Yes. Mike? Yes. Beth? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, the amendment passes. Now back to the uh, amended minutes. Any further discussion? Great. Let's roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Don? Yes. David? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Fred? Yes. Mike? Yes. Beth? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay. Love roll call votes. Great. Okay. <laughs> all right. We good? Thank you. We're all set. Thank you, everyone. So um, piggybacking a little bit on, on Noah, uh, who talked a little bit about COVID and what's going on. So today, uh, at 9.30, I was on a Zoom call with the Commissioner of Education, uh, Commissioner Riley, who made the statement that at 10.30 there will be a press conference and he is not asking to renew the mask mandate in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts after February 28th, um, pretty much ending the mandate as, as we go forward. Fast forward at 10.30, Governor Baker got on, Commissioner Riley got on and said the same thing. What that means for us is that after uh, February 28th, DESE and MDPH is recommending uh, masks only for students who are unvaccinated and staff that are unvaccinated. They've pretty much dropped the recommendation for all other folks attending uh, pre-K to 12, pre-K to 22 schools, um, with the exception of buses. Uh, it's a federal mandate still that if you're a student or a staff person on a bus, you need to wear a mask and clinics. So in our clinics, the nurses will issue a mask to a student that comes to the clinic and the nurses will, will stay masked in the clinics. Um, my recommendation to the, to, the, to the committee is that we've followed along with DESE policy and MDPH policy since August of, of 2020, that as of February 28th, we continue to follow the DESE and MDPH policies regarding masks in our district and follow along with the MIA policies as they, they modify um, and, and follow suit with the Commonwealth and, and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So that's, that's a big piece on COVID today. Uh, I don't know, I'll take some questions on that now if we have any. Chris. Um, I know enforcement has always been a tough one. Um, what do you see the enforcement on kids that aren't vaccinated? So that's just gonna be a recommendation. It's not okay. gonna be a requirement. Oh. So, so as of January, the department, if you all remember that a school could ask for a waiver if you had an 80% vaccinated rate. And it was required if you got that waiver that unvaccinated students <coughs> wear a mask. In the current or the last update from the commissioner in late January or early January, he dropped that. And it was just a recommendation because of the enforcement of that, because of HIPAA and different rules out there, nobody could really go ask people their vaccination status. So it became somewhat of an issue. So they've modified that. And, and really, if you, you could see this coming, it was gonna be a recommendation, mm -hmm. not a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, the only requirement is gonna be on buses again, and that's coming from the Fed and in clinics, and that's coming from the state. And I actually think that's, that's decent practice <coughs> for us. Um, so we will do that. Students will be allowed to wear masks if they choose. Staff will be allowed to wear masks if they choose. And he did highlight that, that students should be penalized. And if students pick on others, you should really make sure that people are understanding that students have maybe different medical needs, different social needs. Their, their parents might be telling them to do different things or, or to wear a mask because of their beliefs or what, whatever it is that they shouldn't be punished or segregated or picked on by other students. So it was just being mindful. So. That was pretty big, and I think people are, are anxious and ready about that, and I know it's gonna be a change. Um, my wife's school had the 80% prior to the holidays. They came unmasked. When the spike went up, they masked up again. That mask mandate was, was as of Monday, was taken away, and she said it, it, it went from like 50-50 to 60-40 to 70-30 as people become more comfortable. So that's, that would be my recommendation to this committee. The commissioner did say it's a local decision, and again, as we've, at a, as a committee, followed DESE recommendations all along with this, I would ask the committee to follow suit. Um, any other questions around masks? Yes. What is, um, do you have the vaccination rates of? I don't. Okay. I'm just gonna be very, I, I don't. We, st when, when the nurses got slammed with the uptick in contact tracing, they stopped looking 
parents didn't submit their vaccination status so we had to look on our uh on the mass back site um which was extremely time consuming so i can have them start to look at that again uh, just to get an idea of where we're at with vaccination status. I mean, just to just to know if any of the schools are approaching 80 percent, even though that doesn't matter anymore. So I think the only part that we may have to clarify, and I don't know if it's been clarified, is, and I don't necessarily want to turn this into a polarizing discussion. I just think for data collection purposes, mm -hmm. is what is the definition of va vaccination, right? So yes. are we? Mm -hmm. Is it first dose? Is it second dose? Is it like, second dose? So. Mm -hmm. What is that? Um, last, well, last I knew from the state, it was the second dose. Okay. It wasn't, so as long it wasn't as that's a clear thing. understanding, yeah. then um, maybe there's a way to ask. For that. I, I also, I think that it might be important to get that information. I mean, I think that you could go, there was an article I was reading in the Boston Globe that has vaccination rates by town before I came here. Um, I just think having that information out to families so that on February 28th they can make an informed decision as to whether or not they're going to send their kid to school with a mask or not mm -hmm. is important, right? Um, okay. I, that's all. Okay. okay. So you'll see? report that out. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get or that Or see out. what we have at least. I'll see what we can get okay. by, even by next week. So then in terms of the committee, just so that we're all clear, um, we have a default position that we're going to follow the guidance. So as Jeff just said, we're going to follow the guidance. That's our position. Now, as a committee, we can change that. So I guess what I would ask for clarity for the committee, because we're going to meet next Wednesday, mm -hmm. and then we're not meeting again, at least scheduled, until after the 28th. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, in terms of the committee's pleasure, um, if we want to determine now to put that on the next agenda and have a conversation about changing our default position, I would open that up to anyone. Or if you don't want to make that determination now, I would say we need to know by Friday morning um, if you want that on the agenda. Because if we don't put it on the agenda, we're not talking about it. And if we don't talk about it, we're following the, the requirements. So does that make sense? Yes. So we can't vote on it tonight? Um, we could it. vote on it tonight. Um, and if but you'd you like didn't to... make that as one of the options. No, no. Yeah. Well, so I, yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate you asking. So I oh, think sorry. my point would be um, we, if we want to vote tonight, that's fine, but I would anticipate that would mean that we're changing the default position and right. Cause we don't need to vote to do what we already said we were going to do. Oh, we don't need no. to vote. Right, oh, we've already voted, voted that we're going to follow the guidance. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if the guidance changes, our vote, our binding vote so is we don't have to re-vote is what I'm asking. If we, if we want to re-vote, it would be to, we're not following the guidance. Okay. So, so as of right now, we're following the guidance that's, and there will be, you know, uh, it'll be up to people to wear their masks or not correct. at that point, correct. unless we change. Correct. And so that's why I need your help because I don't want to not put it on the agenda <laughs> next week and have one of you say, hey, I want to vote this differently. So I'm kind of giving you all that opportunity and you don't even have to decide now. But basically, if I don't hear from anyone, I'm going to assume we've already voted it. We're following the guidance and that's what we're doing. So does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, can I just say that I think we should have it on the agenda just because if we get any, yeah. hear anything this pat next week or whatever, um, you know, talk of the town or whatever it might be. And also, um, and I just want to be clear on this, this is just the DESE guidance. We're not following what we voted before was just to follow the DESE guidance. And that's what we would continue to do with no vote. Right. Yes. Correct. There's no other Correct. I heard MIA mentioned Correct. in there or something, yeah. but yeah, the, I think the only the only thing, and Jeff and I haven't talked about <clears> this, but we can t all talk about it now, is we intended for the meeting next week to be a comprehensive oh, follow-up right. budget meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could be wrong, but I I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that yes. use of masks is a polarizing issue. Mm -hmm. And the last time we asked for feedback, we got 600 comments, I yeah, believe, or so. Yeah. So hang on one second, Fred, and I'll get to you. So I just, I, I would caution us that unless we want to vote it or unless we maybe want to have a special meeting uh, before the 28th, we just want to think that through. Because if we, I, what I don't want to do is say we're going to do a budget meeting. We have all this stuff prepared and we don't get to the budget because of this conversation. So that's, I just want folks to think about that. Fred, yes, please. Uh, what we had voted last time was not Desi guys, but the Department of Public Health guys my motion so if we don't take any votes we're going to be following the guidance of the massachusetts department of public health 
uh, that is actually know, true. He's right. And, you know, I do have to add, I can't tell you the amount of emails and messages that I received today from happy parents wanting to know how soon the masks can come off. Will that be effective tomorrow? Is the question that they wanted to know. They were very happy about today's announcement. So Fred, just backing up, yeah, Fred, just as a clarifying question then, so you, what was the pre, you have the motion in front of you that we voted previously? I, I don't have it, but okay. I'm the one that made it, and it was to follow the guidance of the Mass Department of Public Health. And all, and where is this you know, and deputy, of course, but it was the Mass DPA, which I think that's in conjunction. I think, with, can I, uh, I think they were together. They were together. They were together. They were, together. They were, they were like this. And I'm going to. They were to, I, I believe they were together because they it didn't be the come minutes. out with yeah. it should be in the minutes. Um, they, they didn't come out with separate guidance. Yeah. No. Can I just ask? I don't I agree with you, Chris. I don't think we need to make it a thing. I think that February 28th, it is what it is. Yeah. My only concern is that we get information out to families so that they can make informed decisions about the choices for their families. Sure. So, Jeff, whether that's yep. announcing next week, here's the latest vaccination data by age group. Um, whether it's sending a link out to an email to the community members when you explain, you know, that this is happening, just making sure that everybody has the information they need to make a decision for what's best for their family. That's all. Sure. Yeah, and I don't look, I want every school committee member to be comfortable with the decision we're making. So if we want to have a meeting on it, we can have a meeting on it. I just don't think we should have it next Wednesday no. if that's dedicated time to a budget. That's that's my only request. No. So, yes, Chris. Uh, uh, Chris go ahead. Um, I was just going to click away if anyone's not doing it, just look back and see what we actually did vote on. I was just curious to know when that regulation, uh, when the guys came out. August 20, August, 20, August 21st. August 21st. <laughs> yeah. So if, if, yeah, if you go into uh, the I'm not doing that. Yeah, if you can do that, that would be great. Yeah. 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 Um, or if we want, look, we can make a motion now that says we're going to follow the guidance from DPH or GESI if we want to go as abundance of caution and then we don't have to look it up. So, Second. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Any further discussion? Okay. R roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Shell. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. <laughs> Fred. Uh, can you just re-clarify? Did you cut out? Just yeah. So the motion is we're going to follow the uh, guidance from Desi or DPH. Uh, basically, so we be following the following. we'd be following the current guidance. Definitely yes. Okay, Mike. Yes. Beth. Yes. Chris. Okay, so then you don't have to look it up. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. So we're going to move on from that one then. Again, if anyone feels otherwise, just let me know. The agenda we try to get that finalized by Friday at noon at the yeah, latest. So if you change your mind, let me know if you want it on the agenda. And if it's on the agenda, then um, we might put it on the agenda to say we're going to have a date to find a meeting, uh, just so we're all clear. Because I think February 9th, unless you feel otherwise, we, we need to we need to spend some time on the budget. Okay, great. I see nodding heads. Awesome, Jeff. Non mandated non mandated busing. You should work so on non-mandated it. busing, mandated busing. I think it's something that I wanted to talk to the committee about that we've never really addressed. And the committee doesn't have a lot to determine in non-mandated busing, but uh, I think we needed a, an overview. So in the Whitman Hanson Regional School District, we are required by law to bus all K-12 students who live two miles and out. It's the law. We have to bus them. And we all know that we get regional transportation reimbursement for that. We get actually regional transportation reimbursement for anybody 1.5 miles and out. So when I came, became superintendent, I found the loophole in that law and said, we were only busing kids out a mile and, or two miles out. We can pull it back in a little bit and get more reimbursement by busing our kids. That's the law. We also provide non-mandated busing for students who live 0.5 miles to 1.5 miles, and the towns actually pick up that cost. I want to be clear, we don't have a mandated bus. Bus number 18 isn't mandated, and bus number 22 is non-mandated. We put all our kids on the same bus. But the towns pick up that non-mandated cost. It's not part of the assessment. It's a separate line item at town meeting. 
questions have come up in the past about non-mandated busing and do we need it what can we do so we presented this pre-covid because um, i remember we were sitting in the performing arts center talking about the non-mandated busing and the question came from the town of whitman because they spend more money in non-mandated busing than the town of hansen does the cool thing when we go when we dig into this you'll find that we truly have local regional elementary schools like there's a lot of kids that are a mile and a half to the school and that's a tr really true local elementary you not you don't have to get a bus to get on there um, so that's the law let me just read our school committee policy um, students be entitled to transportation from the school at the expense of public schools when transportation conforms with applicable uh, provisions of the law and then we get that reimbursement for that mile and a half so there's a law and we actually have a school committee policy on that we also have transportation guidelines that we've been in district for a while I think some of this started back when when um, dr. McEwen was here but in our transportation guidelines for the district we also bus all kindergarten students whether they're mandated or not we bus all it's, it's our rule that we do that we also in our guidelines say that we take into account if a student is under a half mile crossing routed routes which is 14 18 58 and 27 kindergarten where local registered sex offenders live and areas that have no sidewalks so we might bus students under a half mile under non-mandate under non-mandated taking these things into account okay that's in our transportation guidelines so in the bus structure oops, did i just click off or on did i go the wrong way oh, awesome <laughs> what did i just do did i just move So if you see in your handout, we bus kids by tier. And this year, we have 20 buses. We have to contract 20 buses in our current structure. And then we bus by tier. And you'll see in a future, in a future slide what those tiers are. So we have six buses at tier four, 12 buses at tier three, and two buses at tier two. The bus tiers are created uh, with student capacity in mind geographical area and total drive time so we have a system called VersaTrans which we contract with first student that we plug in all our data into VersaTrans it will look at their maps the Google Maps and then plot out the most efficient effective ways to get our kids to school within the parameters of our school start times and making sure that we get kids there safely they look at routed routes they look at, at the easiest pathway and that's what that's what VersaTrans does they they um, they look at the addresses from our, our student information system the next slide is basically what we have today if we plugged in all of our existing students now we'd have two buses at tier two we'd have three or twelve uh, uh, twelve three tier buses we'd have six four tier buses and kindergarten these are our half day pickups in the afternoon and deliveries um, they go at 60 bucks a pop or 361 dollars a day you'll see to the right it's 97 40 72 a day to bus our kids our current kids if we're using 22 23 standards and you will see down below we utilize 20 buses 19 high school buses nine middle school buses at Hanson, nine middle school buses at Whitman, 12 at Indian Head, eight at Conley, and seven at Duval. So you'll see, no, we don't use 20 buses at the high school, but we do have 20 buses running between Indian Head and Conley, so we have 20 on the road. I know it's frustrating for parents and for committee members and for the superintendent and the principal to see half high school buses filled in the mornings and the afternoon, 
but we don't have any really, we have one non-mandated student within the high school parameters because of the distance for the high school. So we have to contract those buses and, uh, and keep them running. So I had Karen Villanueva on the next slide, slide five. I had Karen Villanueva pull using current data and plug everything into our sandbox, which is one of the elements in Versatrans, if we pulled Whitman non-mandated busing, how that would affect us. So it does, it changes the tier system, but if you look at the right under extended amount, it doesn't necessarily change drastically the amount per day. It just changes the tier system. So if we pulled Whitman non-mandated busing out, we'd have one route at two tier, we'd have 18 buses at, uh, at three, and one bus at four, for a total of 96.06.90 a day. That's pulling all of Whitman non-mandated out of the question. You'll see down below, 19 high school buses, nine Hanson Middle School buses, five Whitman Middle School buses, 12 Indian Head, eight Conley, and then seven Duval. If we pull all non-mandated busing out of Whitman, this is a little bit of a change. We actually lose a bus. We cut down to 19 total. So you'll have zero tier one buses, you'll have five tier two buses, 14 tier threes, zero, two, zero tier fours for a cost of $9,011.36 a day. Down below you'll see 19 high school buses, nine Hanson Middle School, five Whitman Middle School, 12 Indian Head, four Conley, and three Duval. And these are just numbers right now. I'm gonna to get to the, where school committee really has to understand if, if this changes how it affects us and our students. So slide number seven basically explains out what we pay, what the differentials would be with moving Whitman Middle School non-mandated and removing all non-mandated. So you're looking at a total difference in, 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 the, in the transportation budget of 24,087 by removing, removing Whitman Middle School and all non-mandated is 131,284 in the overall transportation cost. And you'll see the differentiated down below with non-mandated. And Mr. Stanbrook's actually gonna go through the numbers with a little more detail than these so you can explain, so it can be more, um, you can understand why the costs are gonna be a little bit different. This next slide, I think is the critical slide for, for people in our community, for our school committee. So we were asked, and we asked parents every year to tell us if they don't want the bus. So you'll see our total students at Conley is 492. 78 parents responded to us and said, don't put me on a bus. I've got, I'm driving, they're walking, whatever reason they're not taking a bus, and you'll see that column down. 84 at Duval, 106 at Whitman Middle, 190 at the high school, 400 total students in Whitman are not taking the bus. Uh, in Hanson, it's 40, 46, 157 for 253, a total of 740 or 701 students of ours are not taking a bus right now by the parents saying, don't put me on a seat. Everybody else, we kind of assign a seat. If we remove non-mandated busing in Whitman or at Conley. Sorry, could you say that again? If, <laughs> I thought I was pretty loud, Siri. Um, <laughs> If we remove non-mandated at Conley, we're putting 328 more students in cars or, or walking to the school. There will only be 86 mandated students outside of that mile and a half coming to Conley for a total of, you know, we, right now we bus 414. So we have to look at that. We all know where Conley is and what the traffic patterns might be. Duval, we're busing 87 students and non-mandated, we are putting 253 students on the road or in cars or walking. With middle school, it's 173. We do bus more at Whitman Middle at 235. Um, the high school, like I said, only has one student from Whitman. Um, we bus 438 students from the high school. Um, and Hanson down below, you'll see the non-mandated versus the mandated, there's less students. And Hanson has some, you know, uh, the schools are further apart. The next slide just kind of tells you a little bit about how the budget will be affected. It's not based on just buses and ridership. 
It's based on the tier system. And even if we lose that many students, we still have to hire those, have those buses contracted and we still have to adjust the tiers. So uh, bottom line is the more four tier buses, the more, the more we save as we go. That, this last slide before John gets into it a little bit with money. These are some of our concerns that we pose to the town. Again, the taxpayer has the ultimate decision at the ballot box uh, or at town meeting. Um, more students out and about on the roadways with parents, um, parents driving. We have an influx of cars and drop off and pick up at schools. Uh, distracted drivers are an issue right now. If I have more kids walking, we have more kids on the road. Uh, wa uh, potential of, of distracted drivers when they're trying to cross the street. We do have a number of sex offenders in both communities, level one, level two, level three. Um, Non-supervision, I'm looking at middle school students walking without any parent, uh, without parents and no supervision. Crossing the railroad tracks in certain areas of both communities. Uh, parents that don't have transportation right now, uh, they can't get their kids to school. Uh, parent, grandparents or, or people who are, are, are staying at home watching their kids that can't get them to school. In clement weather, we did have an issue just recently. All our sidewalks were not done by that Monday when we, re we returned to school just this week. I'm still getting some parents that saying my kids are on the street uh, because the sidewalks haven't been cleared and I can't blame DPW or anybody. We're, they did the best they could. Crossing numbered ro routes or routes 14, 18, 27, 58. Um, one of these, our district guidelines says students can't cross those roads, so we'd have to adjust our guidelines to make sure they can. We'd have to increase, or the towns would have to increase their crossing guards. Um, the K siblings would be on a bus and their other siblings wouldn't be on a bus. Um, and their daycare providers, uh, we sometimes bus students to their daycares based upon the needs of the families. So. I have some concerns if, as a, as a superintendent, about attendance and school, students getting to school on time if, if non-mandated goes away. And I absolutely understand the cost of that. I don't know if parents at home understand that the taxpayers of Whitman and Hanson provide a service for those students between a half mile and a mile and a half. Um, so I want parents to understand that this could go away and it could go away in a year. And this is what we as a school district would have to face. If it's not passed in Whitman next year um, or the year after, I'm putting 307 cars or 300 plus cars in the Conley driveway. And we might have to adjust where we do bus drop off and pickup. I'm gonna have to look at how many kids walk to school and making sure that the sidewalks are cleared before we open school on a snow day. Um, we have to make sure that our students are safe walking in groups and not by people who might be deemed as dangerous in, in our communities. So it's, it's a matter of cost. Uh, and again, it doesn't necessarily affect the school committee, but I, under, I want you to be aware that if certain things go away, I know parents will be coming to you and saying, well, how, how come this happened? And how come I don't have a ride anymore? So I, I, I just wanted you to be aware, we've never presented on this before. And I want John to kind of go through the numbers and what it would look like because it would shift the assessment to the towns because our transportation costs would remain high even though Whitman or Hanson wouldn't be playing a line item in the budget. So John, oh. I'm gonna change. Yeah. Go ahead, Beth, sorry. You go. So I guess I'm just wondering the purpose is, do you have an idea that the mandated busing might come up as a, I mean, every year it's just glossed over. I mean, I go to every Whitman town meeting and I have for years and I know, I think one year we try, we brought it up to vote on it. And I mean, it was overwhelming support that, you know, it not get dropped. Are you, you know, I'm just wondering why this it, came it, up. Is it, is it something that you're hearing? So I've been asked, I've been asked in previous years to provide an explanation of mandated busing and non-mandated okay. and how we could potentially reduce. And, and I said, the difficulty is I can't just pull kids off a bus because I still have to run the route. Yeah. And the cost is the cost. So we did our due diligence and tried to, and, and I was asked by um, the last, the meeting I had in 2020 or 2019 to try to get parents to tell us what they wanna do. Can we reduce the number of routes potentially? So we did that and you saw the number of parents that have said, no, I don't have to take the bus. What I 
think a lot of parents say is, I don't want to tell you I don't want to take the bus we just don't. in case I need the bus. Right. Because once we establish all our routes, it can't really change. Right. Or we do. If a family moves in and we have to change because they're mandated, we do that. But that'll adjust everybody's, everybody's bus stop or everybody's pickup time. Mm -hmm. So we try to do this as least as possible. But I know um, it's probably going to be asked, and when I told Mr. Heinemann I was going to be presenting this to the school committee, he said, please make sure you do the same presentation to the FinCon because they want to have an understanding. So I don't know the talk, but I know it's been bubbling before, and I don't want the school committee to be shocked if for some reason it comes up in March and it, it is a real thing, and you folks are saying, oh my goodness, I'm going to have, there's going to be 370 cars going to Conley now. What are we going to do? Or Jeff, how are you going to solve that problem? Because we're going to have to do a traffic study. We're going to have to look at that. Um, or same thing at Duval. We all know this, the, how tight it is Duval. and how many cars are already in there. Mm -hmm. So again, this is more of a, 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 a not a preventative, but a, I want to get out in front of this with the committee to let them know. And I want to be transparent. This is what we've, we've done. We've tried our best to do this. And the explanation of the tiers and the routes are, are the, what we can do best. Um, we could, you know, uh, I can't hold parents' hands who say respond to the survey or respond to this. We do our best. We had parents, I asked them about vaccinations. They don't, they don't respond sometimes. I've asked them about test kits. I get a, a quarter of our community responding. So to have an accurate number on transportation, unless you associate a cost. In the town of Pembroke, where I live, they send me something, do you want transportation? Send me a $500 check. So if I want my kids on the bus, I have to pay for it. That means I respond. If I don't respond, there's no bus coming to my house. So we can't charge, we can't charge as a regional school district. The two communities, if they decide to move away from non-mandated, could individually charge, but we don't have a mechanism mm -hmm. to collect, and we would have quite a bit of difficulty to add those students to our current routes based upon that. Um, could Whitman, and I was brainstorming, like, could Whitman mm -hmm. take away this and, and run their own non-mandated busing and charge parents themselves? potentially, but I don't think they have a mechanism to collect those funds as either. And I remember having this conversation with Frank and he's like, yeah, just, if there's no mechanism to collect. Because this has been an issue since I became superintendent in 2018. It died, it died out a little with COVID because we just wanted to get kids back. Yeah. But I know it has been an issue and I just wanted to address it and, and bring to light how many kids live within that circular mile. You saw at, at, at Duval and Conley, only a certain amount of kids, less than 100 are taking the bus. Everybody else with, lives within a half a mile to a mile and a half, which again, as a community school, outstanding. But I am concerned that some of those kids aren't gonna come to school or their parents aren't gonna get, you know, the bus picks them up, you, you get Johnny on it and it's okay. But if they have to walk, if they have to walk in snow or rain or whatever, it is a concern. So I'm just gonna change a slide so you can see what John has. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so this is, these are complex calculations on, based on three scenarios. The only way I know how to do that is to kind of take it step by step and do each calculation and try to go through it and then see what, you know, what's going on and each time we uh, make a calculation. So um, on, the, on the form here, the assumptions are that in scenario one is the, the, um, the non-mandated busing is as submitted in the fiscal year budget, uh, 23 budget last, uh, last week. Uh, scenario two was if there was no Whitman Middle School busing. And then scenario three is if there's just no Whitman uh, non-mandated busing at all. Um, so with, the, with step one, uh, we'd have to, we have to determine the fiscal year 23 general fund transportation budget. So again, uh, scenario one is what was submitted and those are the, um, the components of what comes up to the amount that gets charged as a transportation assessment to each town um, in, in general. So this uh, 1843 is what was on last week. Um, in the scenario two, it would be with no Whitman Middle School, it would be 1818. Again, I'm gonna round the numbers off and try to move through them, but if you have any questions, please stop me. I'll, I'll, start, I'll stop and try to explain. Scenario three would be $1.7 uh, million if there was no uh, Whitman bu mandated busing, sorry, 
non-mandated busing at all. Um, after you find that out that number, you, step two is to determine the additional transportation costs that would get assessed to each town uh, per the 60-40 split. So this, um, again, that uh, this is the math in scenario one of how it was done last week's, uh, in that last week's budget, $390,000. Uh, $390, uh, scenario two would be 451, and then scenario three would be 713. So what's going on there is there's still transportation costs, and yes, they're not. Um, you know, Whitman is pulled out of the non-mandated side, but it's but there's still transportation costs that have to be split through the 60-40 split. So um, that's that's that number right there. Um, again, step 3A and 3B after that is we take that amount, the amount that needs to be uh, assessed through the operational assessment uh, for transportation, and those are the amounts um, based on the per pupil split uh, between Whitman and Hanson, 236 and 153 in the budget last week, and uh, other, uh, through the other two scenarios of 273, 178, so scenario two, 432,000 and 280,000 in scenario three. Um, after that, we have to determine um, what the bus payments to first student are. Because what we're doing now is we're trying to find the per pupil cost, the per, per student riding the bus cost, let me say that again. So um, step four is to take the uh, uh, amount that we pay to first student, which is the amount that uh, the, this is a straight payment, and then there's a $10,000 fuel surcharge allocation for a, a total of $1.763 million. And in scenario one, that would go down in scenario two, and that would go down in, to 1.6 in scenario three. Um, in step five, we take the determined, uh, we, we find the per pupil bus riding costs. So scenario one is 27.29, that's how many bus, uh, bus riders we have. So it's a cost of $646.14 per rider. In scenario two, we have less riders because Whitman Middle Schools uh, isn't right, uh, aren't, aren't included. Um, so that's a total of 680.45 uh, per student riding the bus. Scenario three, Whitman has no, no non-mandated at all. There's 1,974 people riding the bus um, for a a cost of 826.77 for each student. Um, so, uh, flipping over to the, the, if you're looking at the handout, so the next step is step 6A and 6B is you take that a, a cost per student and then you multiply it by how many students ride the bus for each town under, and under each scenario and that's how you end up with the amounts that would, that the additional uh, amounts that would be charged to um, each town through the operation uh, assessment, not the non-mandated busing assessment, but the operation assessment. Um, so step seven, A, B, and C w is a calculation of what the savings would be um, from the not having non-mandated, but also the additional cost of through the operational charge of the 60-40 split. Um, so that's, this is the total um, savings to, to the towns or, or, additional, or additional charge to the town based on those two things. Um, so with Whitman, it would, they would save, um, they save nothing under the first scenario because it's as submitted. The second scenario, it saved 91,000. And the third scenario, they'd save, four, they'd save the entire amount from non-mandated. But in step 7B, they would be charged an additional amount on the 60-40 split for the operational transportation of, uh, again, nothing in scenario one, 273,000 um, th uh, in uh, scenario two, and then 195 for scenario three. So the, the savings, the total savings for Whitman, if they were to do th those two scenarios, it would be 54,680.72 in scenario two and 292,000 in scenario three. Um, again, similarly, the uh, steps A, 8A, 8B, and 8C are for w what it would cost to Hanson, because Hanson would see an additional cost if we were to do this. Um, and it's a similar thing with scenario one, it's all the same. Scenario two, it's, um, there would be an additional uh, 
cost of six thousand four fifty on the non mandated part um, twenty four thousand on the mandated part for a total of thirty thousand five ninety three for the uh, um, additional assessment to to Hansen and then in Whitman I'm sorry in, in scenario three I apologize there would be an increase of thirty three thousand in the non mandated part a hundred and twenty seven thousand in the mandated part or over a total of a hundred and sixty one thousand for Hansen um, under if if Whitman were to do that and then the final part is step nine the state reimbursements um, this is the this is the the uh, formula that we get for state reimbursement for regional transportation um, it's the uh, reimbursable transportation salaries and you add the the uh, amount of money that was in the uh, budgeted from the, the top would step one you subtract the non-mandated busing assessment because the state doesn't uh, reimburse us for non-mandated things. They're not going to reimburse us for things that we that people already pay for, and then 121,000 for Hanson's non-mandated uh, assessment. So, the scenario would be 1.36 million um, under the current budget as submitted, and scenarios two and three, um, we're shifting costs to the state uh, for reimbursement. Um, because we were pulling out non-mandated costs. So there's 1.4 in scenario two and 1.6 in scenario three. Um, I, I know it's a lot of math, but that's what's going on. So appreciate John with math. I just want the public too and the school committee, this is not your vote. I want you to be aware because if things shift at town meeting, we need to be aware because it does change the assessment that we can control. Not really, but it's, it's our assessment that we sent to the communities. So I really wanted John to break it down financially, those pieces of decisions that might be made um, for a, a line item uh, going forth uh, at, at town meeting. It affects our students. If it goes away, it affects our students. If it's in place, it affects our students. We're in a good spot. Um, but to answer your question, Beth, like it's not, it hasn't been brought to my attention yet, but having a little bit of forethought to share some things with you and having John do the math um, and explain out what that actually is, is something I wanted to share because it is budget time and I didn't want anybody to be shocked come April if this is a conversation piece. Okay, so in addition yeah. to what I asked then, uh, Hanson ha has not shown any interest in stopping their non-mandated? As of right now, no, that's correct. Okay, so that's, that's, why, that's why there's none of that. There's, I, we didn't do any ha Hanson calculations as of yet. That'll be our next step, but they have not said, hey, look, we're looking to do this at, at any point. Plus, it's a little bit different on the layout. Correct. The town, so, and the schools. Don. So my question would be, can we still service all these students on a bus with fewer buses? So I asked that question, um, looking at page eight, and thank you, John Stanbrook, for yep. running the numbers. Um, but just to get back to the basis, all these numbers are based on 20 buses, it sounds like. Correct. Okay. Um, so on page five, and we start with the district needs 20 buses because Indian Head requires 12 and Conley requires eight, and they run at the same time? Yes. That, okay. Um, so 12 buses and eight buses, that's what the, the entire sort of formula and numbers are based on if I turn to page eight you give us the total number of kids on those buses so Conley's at the top so total bust 414 kids on eight buses that's 51 students per bus I don't know what the maximum ridership is on a bus um, and then Indian Head we just saw 12 buses they have 453 students that's 38 kids on a bus. So you have to look at the demographic of when you're transferring kids from Indian Head to Montponset. You, you have a Whitman's five square miles, whereas Hanson's greater. So okay. again, you might have less kids on a bus because of the demographics of where the buses are picking up. Okay, I. Yeah, I, further away. It's not that correct, but yeah. Hanson's not that big a town. It's not Plymouth. You know, the so, square so, miles. So um, I have some. I guess my question is if 51 students can go on a bus in Conley, we could reduce, could we reduce buses? Because of the, you know, 
I don't think it's that. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But I don't think yeah. it's that simple. I just a think time is involved, and there is a law that states the maximum amount of time a student can ride on a bus, and that is in the regional school district transportation law. We don't want kids on a bus for an hour by any means. Close. But I, I would just look at those numbers and see: is it possible to still service all these students on buses, make keep them safe, and perhaps reduce our costs because the cost. Um, You've, you've got it per day, right? And, and that's a number of $9,600. When we did this exercise um, a year or two ago, it was $9,031 a day. So it's gone up $600 a day. It's, you know, yeah. and I know yeah, the transportation companies, you know, they're aware of last year and COVID, right? They may have, they had to reimburse us and, and there weren't as many transportation costs. Um, so costs are definitely going up and fuel costs are going up and the expenses. Um, so I would just want to still keep our students safe and service them. And is there a way to, I, and I know Karen's looked at the routes and mm -hmm. so forth. So I the, the one thing, the, when you talk about reducing, but we're, we have to have at least 19 because I'm running 19 at the high school. So, I mean, you, you can shuff, shuffle your routes, but I'm running 19 buses at the high school. That one additional bus, if that Whitman Middle, we can look at, at that, but it would be down to 19 anyway. Um, Why do we need 19? I, I don't know. That, that's how many it takes to get our high school kids. That takes 19 buses to get our non, our, all of our students to the high school based on the data that she has right now. Even with the parents, with, uh, I'm going to look at my sheet here, with that's 123 kids on a bus. I know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don, when you say 23 kids on a bus, what number are you using? Oh, so on page eight. Yeah. Total bust from Whitman Hanson High School. Oh, I apologize. I didn't realize it was broken out. So we've got 439 and 256. Yes. That's the Hanson. Okay. Yeah. 439 from. Okay. Whitman so we need to add those two. So together. roughly call it. Six. Seven hundred. Six seventy. Okay. 700 divided by 19 okay all right so we can continue to look at this again i'm trying to bring it to the committee to it's 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 not a it's not a committee decision but it's a committee understand the impact understanding and a responsibility if things change um and i want you to be aware and, and it, it is makes me anxious if we do reduce and the amount of traffic that we put on the roads or, or just cars and and kids um and the way this past storm hit um, on the blizzard of Sunday, um, DPWs in both towns did a great job. wasn't a hundred percent, but we managed. This last ice storm was a challenge for both DPWs, and their sidewalks are still not done in some areas. So I did have f feedback, and I shifted over to both both towns. But those are, well, those would be decisions that I would have to work with if I didn't know kids were getting a ride to school. So, Fred, uh, a couple of things. One is. Uh, if we increased the uh, ridership on a bus in Hanson, that bus would take longer to do its route. So if we were able to, you know, reduce that, we would probably run into some contractual differences as far as start times go within the schools, uh, but also have to start high school even earlier to get that jump start so we wouldn't be stopping so late because the same buses are used from one school to the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, and uh, to answer Ms. Stafford, the FinCon last year in Whitman, uh, they did not recommend the uh, non-mandated busing uh. line item, and that's what sort of spurred this. And I believe it started the year before with some folks uh, wanting to perhaps charge students. And Don, maybe you could, uh, you know, expound on that a little bit. <coughs> Had yeah, I, I remember the FinCom not recommending it. Yeah. But I don't think she's has anything to expound. No. Um, other questions, comments? Steve. Um, this is not going to be quite the thing people want to hear, but I live down near the area of the middle school. And because of the traffic pattern at 18 and 27, has changed dramatically. The traffic in the afternoon backs up terribly 
in front of Pothel Ave coming from the middle school. I don't have to say there's going to be a tragedy there, but it is terrible. And now if you introduce more cars, there's, the town needs to get a hold of the state and something needs to be done about that intersection. Mm -hmm. And I plan to bring this, I mentioned the one selectman, that it, it's absolutely terrible how bad it is because people aren't moving up in line. There's only one line to get either right or to go downtown. Um, the traffic every afternoon is horrendous. I can almost see it from my street. My street is several blocks down from Cothell Ave. It is horrendous right now. Mm -hmm. They need to do something. They change the structure. You cannot have any more than one lane going straight. Only four or five cars go through the light. They get caught up with distractions from Cumberland Farms, from coming out of the old Johnny Foodmaster Peapod there. Um, people will hold up lines. They will go over the yellow line to get up into the left lane because there isn't enough room. And it backs up all the way to where the crossing guard is. And after she leaves, I myself almost got run over by someone I was in the crosswalk, the light was red, and there were people still moving about because they were so distracted. It's a terrible situation. We're very fortunate nothing's happened yet. I know I might sound a little out, out of line, but that really needs to be thought of. So there is absolutely no way I'm, I'm voting to get rid of any man, not mandated busing. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you. So, yeah, one second, because I actually have a couple quick things. So, one is a comment, according to Google, Hanson's 15 square miles and Whitman is seven, so it's about a little more than twice the size, um, unless Google is wrong. Uh, question on slide eight, where it says no bus. Do we know what percentage of the folks that are no bus are mandated versus non-mandated? Slide what? I'm sorry. On in slide eight, right? So we're looking at the total counts. There's the section that says total students and then no bus and then non-mandated and mandated. Do we know of those that are, I'm, I'm assuming those are three different, those are three independent categories. <coughs> no bus, yes. non-mandated, and mandated. Yes. Do we know the split of the no bus in terms of whether they'd be mandated or non-mandated? These are the parents, the no bus are the people that, no, I don't. I so, don't and here's that. why yes. I think that's relevant. Yes, okay. Because I, I believe, I know your and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the state law does not distinguish on optionality it's simply a requirement. Correct. So while it might be nice that we have some parents that have said, hey, I'm not taking the bus, I don't think the law, the law unless I, and, and I just looked at it real quick, I don't think it provides an optionality to say, if you're mandated, but you opt out. Like, I don't see that. So right. just so we're careful, it's great the parents are doing that, and I have no problem with what we're doing. But as soon as we start to build the process where we say, we're not gonna count those as mandated folks, they could very quickly change that opt out to say, well, wait a second, I wanna see, you know, I I'm mandated. I wanna see, right. So we, we might wanna pay attention to that. Okay. And then John, just to recap, so I have the numbers right. So if Whitman, um, <laughs> if we do nothing, nothing changes. If if we take scenario two, the cost savings to Whitman would be 54,680. Am I looking at that right? It's the step seven C. Step 7C, am I looking at it right? So is the grand conclusion here that, I just wanna make sure I have the, the, the sum total right. If we, if scenario two was chosen, Whitman would save 40, 54, 680, 72, am I looking yes. at the right number? Yes. And if scenario three was chosen, it would save 292, 345? Yes. Okay, but at the same time, Hanson cost would go up in scenario two to 30,593? Yes. And 161? Yes. Scenario three. So I think it'll be really important that you have to build a scenario from Hanson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because based upon how things have gone in the past and previous conversations and discussion, I would, I would think that if this was to happen in Whitman, Hanson may look at this the same way, which is then going to change, it's going to cause a chain reaction, right? So if Whitman decides to do, not do this, and then Hanson's costs go up and they decide not to do this, then Whitman's costs are going to go back up because Hanson decided not to do this. So before anyone makes a decision, it might be helpful to look at it in totality, not just we're going to make this change over here and assume there isn't going to be a equal and opposite reaction perhaps on the other town. Mm -hmm. So it would be helpful to do that analysis for Hanson because mm -hmm. I think 
Yep. You can see the cost I, savings I, I switch right agree. back. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So when we use the word we, the word we is really the selectman from either town who this ultimately lies with, correct? Right. I just want to know 320 yeah, Harvard Street. We a lot. Um, no, 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 I, I know, but I, I just think it's important that the we is not the school committee. The we would be what people in elected offices at the towns decide. decide. Well, you know, I think ultimately it's, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's a budget line item that goes to town meeting and the voters yeah. have to go through. No, no, correct, correct, but, but it's not a school committee decision to say whether we do this or not, correct? Oh, yeah, I, I just want to be sure right. so that we can get that in the rec. Like, yes. this is not. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. I got Dawn and Thank you. Hillary. It's well, well, actually, no, I got Hillary and then Dawn. You had your hand up. I first. just had a question, and it, it might be in what Chris was asking, John. Sorry. Um, why do, and if you can't answer this now because you have to break down the Hanson thing, that's okay, and I understand it. Um, why does the cost increase for Hanson if Whitman gets rid Good. of yeah. this? It's because there's still some some uh, there are fixed costs that have to be covered, and it be, it's um, they're being covered by less pupils. So it's, it has to do with the per pupil cost, the per student be riding the bus cost, because you you determine what the the cost per student is, and then you you time you you know times that out. So there's there, the costs don't drop at the same rate as you know. Um, the amount of students dropped. So, like for example, I, in it's it's 1.8 or something, and, and um, well, let me get out the get the exact number. So, Hillary, I asked the same question because I said it doesn't make sense. It's, yeah, yeah. I, what, I guess. What you well, well, but, we were, so we were working it out. I'm sorry. I'm just going to ask a clarifying question. Sure. Numbers are not really my thing, <laughs> but um, so are you saying that the cost per pupil for, per student to ride the bus would increase? Yes. If, okay. Yes. And that's that's because in step five. And there's a 60 40 because split with we that still cost. have costs that have to yeah. be covered okay so whitman's cost per pupil would also go up but there would be an expense savings because of the non-mandated okay. correct okay. coming out okay yes okay thank you that, thank yeah. you helpful okay mm -hmm. that was a good question now this is where it's nice that he gave us the spreadsheet because right. you just follow it's just, this is a lot all right for my don and that or don and then mike don and then mike go ahead don actually just to follow up with uh, mr farrow uh, I agree. It's, it's not a vote of ours or a decision, which is why my question was solely around how can we mm -hmm. try to simply still service students mm -hmm. and find a way to save money um, overall, yep. not just for one town or the other, but overall from the transportation top line item. That's all. Mike, sorry. Yeah, so a year and a half ago or two years ago, we went through this that some people wanted to get rid of this. We researched it. Bridgewater rain and was a disaster when they did this. I just kind of went back to my notes. Nine hundred ninety-eight dollars per student we charge. They were charging to pick kids up. Mm -hmm. Like that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that so that if that's what we want to do, I, I, we're not servicing kids. Mm -hmm. Like this is why we're in the world. Families. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's terrible, and I don't even know why this keeps coming up. It's been coming up for the last four years. I don't know why we're going through it again, but we're not helping kids by cutting this. So. I, no, and I think again to George's clarification. But we we just stick to we, we've gone through this every year for hours and hours and hours. Right. And I, I just don't understand why we we keep doing it. Right. So I think the only thing we can do or Jeff can do is if he's requested for data, he can present the data. Yeah. So. And that's Chris. Yeah, I, I I I understand what you're saying, Mike, and I, mean, I agree with you. You guys are not servicing the, the, the students if we were to do away with it. If they were to do away with it. Um, but at the same time, I really appreciate the effort to produce such a comprehensive analysis because then it, it, uh, it I think it um, gives us a little bit of protection, um, in, in, you know, from losing this, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a necessary, unfortunately, it's a necessary process to go through. And I'm glad we did. And I'm looking forward to getting the hands of information and then have everyone be able to make an informed decision. And I think I'm confident that with all this data, it'll be plain as day that it's not a good idea to get rid of it. I appreciate it. So if I want to, one more thing, and the reason why I did it also, we talk budget a lot. We don't talk about transportation a lot. And I think a lot of parents who either attend or don't attend town meeting wouldn't realize that if it was voted down, it would affect them. Right. And that, that was my concern. Yep. When I started looking at the numbers and looking at the radiuses of how many kids it would affect and saying, hey, if this does go away, or whatever, these folks didn't have their voice heard or didn't know that could go away. So I just wanted to be more informational than not. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, come on up and then Don, I think the problem, so in my head, the issue is at the state level, right? The state should come up with a better way, right? Mm -hmm. So they create the mandate, this is what you have to do, it's a blanket statement. Right. You know, maybe, the, you know, through if they could be creative, maybe there's a way to provide a, hey, we're gonna give you a, we're gonna give you an X dollar tax credit if you don't use the bus yeah, right. and opt out yeah, yeah, right. because it would probably be a lot cheaper for the state to do that than to actually the reimbursement and costs that go with it. So ultimately, I, I agree with you. There's got to be a better way to do this because I think we all see the buses and there's no one on. But at the same time, mm -hmm. the state doesn't take that into account with the requirement. So it's, it's annoying. But yes. Okay. So it's Kathleen Otina, uh, Whitman Finance Committee, liaison to the schools. Um, once again, I will need to thank John for the exhaustive work he's done putting the details into this report. Um, the take home message for me really is if the middle school is eliminated, the town of Whitman saves $54,000 and if all of the non-mandated mandated busing is eliminated, we would save $292,000. So when we saw the initial presentation, we being the FinCom, of $485,000 Last year it was 411 and the previous year it was 361. It's like, is there no end in sight to the increases that we're going to experience for busing? And the big difference between Whitman and Hanson obviously is that our kids live within walking distance of the schools to the extent of about 80% of the students, whereas Hanson's, about 20% of the students live within walking distance. So most Hanson children are covered by mandated busing. Um, so I'll be able to take back to the Finance Committee next Tuesday the message that eliminating non-mandated mandated busing or recommending to our Board of Selectmen because it's their policy mm -hmm. that eliminating non-mandated busing would save the town. It's going to save the town $292,000 max. But as a former school committee member in Milton, I can tell you I was on for nine years. The only thing that parents ever called me about was when their kids' bus got changed. Not that they didn't have textbooks, not that there were 30 kids in the classroom because it was the early years of Prop 2 and a half. It was that their kids' bus route got moved and they couldn't stand at their front door and see them anymore. So I know that the trouble of eliminating busing causes when parents all of a sudden wake up and say, what do you mean I have to get my child to school and I have two babies up in, the, in, a, in a crib and it's raining out. So I know that it's not just we'll save a lot of money if we go against the, uh, if we recommend and the selectmen decide to eliminate this policy. So again, John, thank you for the work that you've done to put these numbers together. It gives some credibility to the budget that be, in the past it was just a big fat number. Thank you. Chris? Well, just, uh, quickly, uh, to Chris's point earlier, if, if, if women went ahead and did this, there might be a chain reaction. There may be more expense to women. Oh, yeah. That's, I oh, I heard that part, too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Right next right. <laughs> not that not the past history would ever suggest that uh, chain reaction of things. But mm -hmm. okay. All right. I'm good. Are we good moving on? Yes. All right, great. Thank so, you. John, if you want to come up, the, the next item is we're trying to get folks in our food services um, to a, a living wage, the minimum wage in the state. And we found through time, Nadine has brought up the, the situation that we have people that aren't making uh, minimum wage in the in the Commonwealth. So John has a, a handout for you to look at, and we need school committee approval to make these wage changes. <coughs> Did they get the handout? I, yeah. Yes. Do. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fantastic. Of course they got the handout. <laughs> um, so um, right now, uh, uh, with the handout here, the, this is for the food service. Or I call it school lunch because I'm still in the town thing, but it's a food service. Um, Right now, for general workers, step one is twelve dollars and sixteen cents, and uh, step two goes to twelve eighty six. Step three, thirteen twelve, thirteen seventy four at step four, fourteen twenty six at step five, and fifteen thirty at step six. And anyone that has a, is a substitute uh, gets twelve sixteen an hour. Um, right now, the uh, the minimum wage went up to fourteen twenty five as of January first, twenty twenty two. Um, we're um, we're not subject to the to the minimum wage, so we don't have to charge 14.25. Uh, we, we don't have to to give that wage, but um, I mean these amounts, in my view, are, are low, and it, uh, it, at least we could bring them up to what the mass minimum wage is, or, or 14 dollars and 25 cents. So that would be a two dollar and nine cent increase to anyone that was a general worker or a substitute. Um, and I, I put the, the, the costs 
um, down below, and it would be if we did it for an entire year, it'd be thirty-seven thousand um, dollars. If we retroed it back to January first, we ret made it retroactive uh, back to January one, which when the state went to the um, to the fourteen twenty-five dollars uh, per hour, um, it would cost twenty-five thousand uh, five eighteen. Uh, right now, I, I left it over there, but I believe that the the, uh, the school lunch um, fund has a hundred and eighty-six something in the, in it, but. Like, again, it's over there, <laughs> but it, there is enough money in the budget to cover uh, in the school lunch to cover this increase. School lunch is entirely f uh, funded by itself. It's there's no no uh, assessment or anything to do with it. It's just its own special revenue fund. So, and I and Nadine uh, Doucette, our, uh, our 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 food service person, not a school lunch person, our food service person is here. Um, if you have any in depth questions, does anyone have any questions for John or Nadine? I mean, it's something. We brought this up a little last year, but we're struggling with em getting employees because an employee can make more money anywhere else yep. than here right now. So I think it's fair to our employees. They work hard. It's a revolving budget. It's self-funded. We don't spend anything out of the district budget because Nadine runs a good program. Um, so she's made that recommendation to John. Um, John brought it to us. I want to bring it to the committee. Uh, we wanted to kind of do it before the holidays. Things got messed up a little bit, so we're bringing it to you, um, and we're looking for some assistance from you to, to or, or some thoughts on this proposal. Yeah? I would move to accept the proposed change by Nadine Doucette. Second. Um, so can you just clarify the motion, though? Um, are you with the uh, retro? That is what I, can I clarify that in discussion? Oh, with with retro, yes. Thank you. Right. Yes, with retro. So the bottom line, because there's kind of a couple options, so I just wanted to make sure your right. motion was clear on what you were motioning. All right, so Don made the motion to, as presented with the retro active increase. Stephen second. And second. Second. Yep. Discussion, Don. So uh, the clarification is the $37,000 is the, is that the total increase from the retro January 1st for FY22? So thirty-seven thousand dollars is what would it have cost for an entire year, and twenty-five thousand is what it will cost this year because we're if you were to retro it back to January first. Oh, okay. Okay, so essentially thirty-seven thousand would be a retroactive back to no. July first. If it was, no, yeah. if it was an entire well, year, but okay. it, that's that's the cost for the entire year. Okay. Okay. Um, Are we? Are we planning on doing a retro? I'm not against it, but are we? So I think the way the motion was presented is that it would be retroactive to January 1st. Yeah. Yes. At the 14.25 per hour. Correct, which would yeah, be a cost street. of 25.518.90, correct? Yes. We can change the motion, but that's the motion, yes? Yes. Okay. Chair? Yes, Fred. Uh, I believe that we have no choice. Not only is this probably the right thing to do, but it's also to be legally compliant, we have to do it. Do we, are we subject to minimum wage? No, because we're an education, we're a school system. We're not. So the right thing to do, Fred, I don't disagree, but I think the, the fact is we don't have to by law. And that's where it got us into trouble by keeping the numbers lower than they have been in a while. Yep, Chris? Do you need an amendment to the... No, I think the... Mo I think, no, I think everyone's good, right? It's So it's... Retro to January 1, but going forward, we all know what that cost would be if we were doing it for a full year. So. Can, I, can yeah. I add one more suggestion? I, I would, in the future, I would like to see us review these rates annually. I think that might be a wise idea. Well, does, can I, does minimum wage go up every year? Or it this is. year, January 1 was the, the, the retro to January 1 was because these were the minimum wage changes as of January 1 this year, correct? Yeah. Uh, the minimum wage has been going up every year in Massachusetts. Um, I think it goes up one more time from yep. fourteen twenty-five to fifteen dollars next January. Okay, so right. then maybe we need to put that down somewhere to yes. look at it. Mm -hmm. I put it. I put it in my notes. Okay. Any other discussion? Everyone's clear on the motion. Great. All right, roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Shell. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. Fred. Yes. Mike. Yes. Beth. Yes. Chris. Yes. Great. Unanimous. Thank you, everyone. So thank you. Um, next is briefly school choice. February we had earmarked as uh, as an um, 
public hearing on school choice. The policy subcommittee brought up school choice at our last meeting. So I just wanted to fill the committee and we will talk about school choice and I wanted to give the policy subcommittee some time to review uh, our school choice policy and how many students we have. So it's, I didn't wanna say we were avoiding school choice in February, but the policy subcommittee picked this up and I want to provide the school committee um, as much information about school choice when you move to vote for or against school choice in e e either the March 9th uh, meeting or the March 16th meeting, depending on where we're at. So we'll do it in March? We'll do it in March. Okay. And we'll have additional information. We should, right, Chris? We should have based okay. upon where we're at. Okay. Um, letter E, and I, I apologize for the uh, administrator's contract um, delay in getting it to. The policy subcommittee met last Wednesday and approved this draft copy um, of the new policy for administrator's contract. I sent it to council on Thursday and Andy sent it back to me this morning. Um, so you have a draft of the proposed new policy for administrator's contract. It doesn't have to be voted on tonight. There can be some discussion tonight. It's a, it's a first draft uh, and the policy subcommittee is meeting again prior to our next meeting. So if you have suggestions on this, uh, or if you want to email me those suggestions. Again, this is a review. It's a first read uh, of that policy. You, I have attached Mass General Laws according to contracts and what's in our policy manual for contracts <coughs> as well. Anyone have any comments or feedback on the policy now? I got two quick things, Jeff. Yep. So um, the third paragraph says the superintendent reserves the right to revisit the financial contractual parameters based on unique qualifications of the candidate. Yes. So if I'm reading the sequence properly and understanding the way it would work is for those that are in scope, mm -hmm. you would bring parameters to the school committee. We would agree to the parameters, but you reserve that final right to go outside those parameters so, if you need to or so, not. So no, the scope would be, um, I'm going to hire a principal for Indian head yep. next year. You tell, we, we meet in an executive, executive session. session. We say it's going to be this is the X parameters. And y. Right. The next step is I interview the candidate. Yep. And the candidate has a double doctor. Yep. And it doesn't fit the scope of those yep. parameters. I come back to the committee before I offer that position. Okay. So then can we change the language? Because I think the way I was reading it, because it says the superintendent reserves the right to revisit the financial contractual parameters. Um, can we just say based, can we add something that says, any changes outside the parameters will be brought to this back to the school committee. Is that something like that? You guys, I mean, um, yeah, the, yeah I, well, or at least consider that because yeah, yeah, that aligns yeah. exactly with what you just said, right? Okay. I, I is that the gist of what we talked about? Yeah, that is okay. exactly. Um, what you, okay. you agree, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, because I mean, right? If we say it's between X and Y, I just it kind of defeats the purpose if you decide to do Y times right. two, right. and we don't know about it, right? Sure. Um, so okay, and then just to clarify, the next section that talks about um basically if there's a second contract for someone it would be renewed uh by the superintendent following the process of the initial contract are we talking about basically the, the process above yes okay so I, maybe just look at that wording too because i just i don't know if there's a way to tighten rather than saying the process of the initial contract as described above like to, something like that would mm -hmm. make it super clear to me yep okay. um, those are the only two quick That's things the feedback for um, so chair yes fred uh, the third paragraph, and I agree with what you want to add, but uh, perhaps the word prior to offering. Uh, uh, There's no right to revisit the financial contractual parameters and consultation, you know, consult with the school committee prior to. Prior to what? Uh, prior, to, and prior to executing the contract or something like that, Fred? executing contract or prior to uh you know uh, negotiating outside of the parameters yep yep i think we're on the i think that's similar feedback right we just need to make sure that jeff has the latitude to collect feedback and work it but if we set parameters and he goes outside the parameters that should come back to the school mm -hmm. as long as we say that bottom line i think we're good mm -hmm. prior to prior to execution fred good point okay, okay great moving on uh, just PTO meetings. I've got a list of, of PTO meetings. Chris and Chris and Jeff, the roadshow is going to try to get out in the next month uh, to meet with PTOs. I had a great meeting at Indian Head today, one of my superintendent's coffees. 
uh, about 12 parents, oh, nice. which was which was the most I've had. And maybe because I plunged, they felt bad, so they <laughs> wanted to come and have coffee with me. Um, but we'll be out and about, and I'll give Chris and Chris the list. Partially is one to, to hear from our community. Two is also to explain how our budget process works in the next month. So the PTOs, you will see us, uh, Duval, Whip Middle, and Conley coming soon. Good. John, you want to go to your financials, please? Thank you. Um, so it's the usual uh, monthly report. Uh, the first document looks like this. It's the 19-page document for the general fund. Um, these are the uh, amounts through January. That happens all the time. So that down here. So um, the for revenues on page one, uh, we've received 30 million. Three again. I'm going to round the numbers. 30.3 million on a 56.7 million dollar budget, um, and that's um, you know, that's a breakdown of where we have uh, on the, on the revenues. And then every every uh, all the assessments. Uh, I'm sorry. All the uh, expenditures uh, on the uh, pages two through 19 um, with a total at the at the end of we've used thirty million six hundred and forty thousand dollars so far on a fifty six seven ninety seven five seventy nine forty budget um, so that's just just the usual document there and um, the second document that I've been giving you every month for a while now is the um, deficits as of January 31st um, there are 21 of them right now f with a total of 560,611.18 number I, I put this on the a little bit on the back burner because I've had other things that I've been working on um, but uh, I, I'm hoping by the next meeting I'll have all of these lined up and, and we'll be able to go through each one of them and and um, and find a source and and get rid of them um, number two is highlighted uh, a district-wide uh, teacher learning professional development salary for sixty-seven thousand uh, dollars. That's been corrected, um, so that's why it's highlighted. It's just it was I corrected it in February, so it doesn't show up in the January uh, report. So um, I did it last week. So that was the one I think we had talked about at the last meeting. Um, I believe it was the last meeting. Maybe it was the me meeting before. Um, it was a uh, a tech person that had been. Um, um, uh, misclassified, um, and I've corrected that since then. So it's a really a 560,000 minus 67, or about 500,000, 490,000. Um, and then the other documents are the ones that I'm going to go through in, in detail in uh, every quarter, but I just wanted to send them out to you um, each month just so you can look at them. Uh, it's the balance, the, one of them is the balance sheet comparison and the revenue and expenditure comparison, um, and then the fund balance activity. And um, just a highlight on that page, just even though we're not supposed to be going through it uh, until the quarters, um, I did add the um, on, at the top, we're under a balance sheet comparison uh, where it says reserved for expenditures. I have added in January's amount, the amount that we would, um, at the end of the year, what would be there. Um, as a reserve for fund balance. So 896,960.11 is would be a reserve for expenditure. Um, 10,685.88 would be reserve for band and bond premium. Um, so the, if you looked at the unreserved, which is the E and D, um, right now if the, um, if the fiscal year ended in, on January 31st, which it doesn't, but if it did, there would be $1.2 million in, in E and D. Um, again, you have to remember that last year for reserve for encumbrances was something like 500,000. I can't remember the amount. I think it was 550 something. So it would be uh, that would come out of that 1.2. Um, so that's kind of how to read this when you're when you're looking at it. Is um, now we're getting closer to the end of the year. We can put real numbers in for reserves, and you can keep an eye on that E and D line and see what. And maybe at the, in the next month, I'll I'll put in a. Um, whatever the encumbrance was for last year, I'll put that number in so you can get a truer picture of what EDD would be. Um, so that's, that's just on that. The other, other documents are um, a breakdown of all the, um, all the expenses, the expenditures in the general fund, and then all the, the listings of all the grants through January. Again, these, these things change because, uh, you know, I find things or things get misclassified and I correct it 
Um, but this is just oh. a snapshot through January. So, if, any questions? Questions from anyone? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank we'll you. spend some quality oh, time next week. I and um, I, I did look at the school lunch. I think I said 186, and it's if you look at the documents in there, it's 168. So I did transposition. 168. I apologize. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. New business pass over number 11. Do you, you want to pass okay. over pass 11? Over, yep. Okay. So we're passing over the high school program of studies. It'll be presented at a later date. Field trips. I yeah. closed out of the folder, so I know one was to Connecticut and one one's was, canceled. Uh, yeah, but Sam There it's canceled. Which one's canceled? <coughs> canceled. That's the one. Okay, so DECA is the only well, one. Mm -hmm. Can I just go back to the program of studies? I don't know if the students were waiting. Um, will that be like the next March meeting, maybe? Obviously not next week. It'll probably be at the March meeting, yes. March meeting. Yeah. And okay. I told the students it was going to be passed over tonight. Oh, so. okay. Okay. Okay, so um, in your packets, there's a field trip request for DECA to do the state conference in Copley Plaza, Boston. So I would entertain a motion to approve that as presented. Second. No, so I need a motion. Oh, there you go. Sorry. So we're, <laughs> David got the, <laughs> David got the motion. I was ahead of myself. You're really going fast. I am, sorry. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Don? Yes. David? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Mike? Yes. Fred? Yes. Beth. Yes. Chris. Yes. Great. Approved. Awesome. You want to talk to Warren? Uh, Warren. Uh, what do you want to propose? So, uh, yeah. So generally speaking, I think. Um, <laughs> so this came up at the end of the last meeting where yeah. um, we've had some challenges in getting the signatures in the warrant because people were out in a way um, and needed to be out. So um, the question was, hey, can anyone sign it? And then we had a conversation about, I think previously as a committee, we had simply voted the four people to sign. Mm -hmm. So I think what we'd be looking for is uh, a motion from the school committee that would say, um, you know, in the absence of the four signers, uh, any school committee member is authorized to sign a warrant. So could I get that motion? No Thank Second. you, Fred. Second. Second. Any discussion? You all get it. If I can, I'll just elaborate for anybody who doesn't know. We just had trouble that it had been a whole week um, after a warrant that because of illnesses, the two yeah. guys couldn't sign. So sure, sure. Um, just Don and I had signed. So it was a problem that, you know, yeah. it hadn't been signed for a whole week. Yeah. So that's what we were looking for was just somebody else could come in and sign. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. And rather than make it one person, and again, it's through no fault of anyone. People yeah. are no, sick. They no. have to stay People away. It's no big deal. So yeah. this this will solve it for us going forward. Yeah. And, yeah. and to be clear, we do have an excellent warrant, um, warrant signing subcommittee. Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and um, so it, it, it's very helpful, like, when we get the, uh, the whether it's payroll or, or whatever other expenses, that it happens on a Wednesday, and Michelle's been terrific in letting us know. Right. So the whole the, the whole process is there; it's going well. Yeah, it's just some some of just, us souls. Just a clink one in a while. Mr. Boyce, you can't get sick again. Yeah, hey, no more sick. Sick. <laughs> this just gives us. A you good and David backup. cannot be out at the same yeah. time. Right, this no more hanging us, out at, at Papa good, Gino. It gives us a good backup plan. So, any other yeah. discussion? Roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. Fred. Yes. Mike. Yes. Beth. Yes. Chris. Yes. Okay. So number 14. Um, so Director of Facilities Ernie Sandlin is retiring in, in August. Um, as you might know or might not know, uh, when, when I and George took over up in central office, we combined facilities and technology into one department calling operations. Now that Ernie's retired and the we don't have a director of technology. We're looking to bring in somebody as a director of operations with a strong facilities background. Um, so in your packet, you have a job description to review. And again, send me edits uh, moving forward. This is a person we're looking to um, be a, a, a supervisor, somebody that the committee can, they will be a true director of operations. So when we give a presentation here, you don't have tech, you don't have facilities. You have somebody who knows both departments pretty solidly. Um, Ernie's going to be difficult to replace. Uh, he has a lot of institutional knowledge, uh, but this is uh, what we've put together as a, as a person that we hope can fit the build. If it doesn't work out, we'll go back to the drawing board and potentially go back to a director and a director. Um, but we're hoping to get a, a true director of operations to join our team. Um, the goal for us would be before, before June um, so that he could experience or she could experience the summer 
as the summer is extremely challenging um, with closing buildings, opening buildings, summer work, things like that. Um, so please look at that, that job description, provide feedback, and I'd, like, I'd look for a vote sometime in March. Okay. Great. Mr. Chair? Yep. Fred, go ahead. Uh -huh. As a little bit of feedback, I would like to see under the qualifications uh, something in relation to knowledge of state building codes, okay. construction. Uh, you know, knowing a lot of the little projects that we do in house. Yes. And you know, watching over folks, I think that that would be very important. Okay. Thank. And, uh, seeing that you're saying this publicly, I'd also like to add, Ernie's going to be a very tough individual to replace. I swear, when the high school was built, he stuck his finger in the cement, tasted it, and told him <laughs> if it had enough water. Uh, you know, he, he's been a fantastic, fantastic person for an awful long time. And I hope he also passes on the knowledge that wires, while they may be color-coded, they may have brown tape, black tape, yellow tape, because things didn't work right and he had it fixed. So hopefully he does that. But I do want to thank him from the bottom of my heart. Yes. Thanks, Fred. We'll share that with him, too. That's why we kind of want to bring somebody in to kind of learn, learn from Ernie for a couple of months um, and shadow him um, going forward. Okay. Chair. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. sorry. Comment. So do we have a director of technology or can you share a little because this sounds like an expanded role, mm -hmm. whereas right now Ernie, Ernie is just facilities focused? We, we, we removed, we lost the director of technology position in 1920. So we have not had a director. No, 19, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I got what you're saying. The 2019, 2020 year. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. That was it. Fiscal, 2019. Year. Yeah. fiscal year. So no. So this is an expanded role. Uh, we will still look at having an assistant director of technology and then kind of look at having an assistant director of facilities as well, where this person supersedes and oversees everything. One of the pieces of this, of Ernie's position, was he was the on-call only person 24-7. Uh, We're looking to expand those in both those areas in tech. We don't want just one person being here 24-7, 365. Okay. So looking at this as it is a facilities-based piece, but really a, a position that runs the both departments. Okay. So it... Yeah, I, I'm just thinking back to how we talked about the budget and retirements, mm -hmm. right? So this is a retirement, similar if we have a, a teacher retiring and, you know, can we recognize savings or how we use that? Um, so essentially there may not be any savings necessarily with this no, position. I'm not look, yeah, that's, that's one of the few. Looking at my teachers, after 30 years of service, you're at a top step in top lane. Uh, Ernie's up there, but I'm pretty sure right now the going rate for somebody in operations or even in facilities, you're looking at the 120 to, to 130 mark, no matter what. With a yeah. technology background. With a technology right. background. Right. So. Yeah. I'd be curious if you find someone facilities focused and technology. That To me, that seems like two different avenues. Um, but if that person's out there, I don't, sure. I don't know. Um, I, I guess I would also just like to look holistically at our school department um i know george actually mentioned he's the grant writer but we you know in central office we have a lot of needs too right mm -hmm. um you know director of hr we don't have director mm -hmm. of performing arts we don't have director manager grant writer and so forth so um i'm just thinking you know this director of operations position is one we're really creating in a way it's moving from a facilities manager to this um, so my last comment will be um, in regards to our strategic plan i did notice that um one on um, number four, that is our um, established safe and secure learning environment, um, safe and secure operations in school. So it, it talks about a flow chart. So create 4.5, create an operations flow chart with updated job descriptions to reflect industry changes in staffing levels. So maybe in the future we can look at the flow chart and how these positions and get a better understanding of maybe where our needs are in relation to you know positions we're creating um, just to fall in line with what we have on the strategic plan okay yeah and it goes along right with it this position if it can be um, done would be has a flow chart attached to it so how does operations then affect both facilities and technology um, the the 
the, the lack of structure we have in the sense of the operations department is that there is no point person for the intricacies that take place. You remember four years ago uh, in a budgetary move, we removed the director of technology because we needed more boots on the ground, as it were, to do different things. So this person would be the spokesperson. This person would be handling the managerial, the budgetarial, uh, all of those different aspects of the whole operations department. And then we'd really be looking to make sure we have an associate director or an assistant director in each to be the people who have the, not only the, the skill of that area, but then have the ability to make sure that the jobs within those areas are done. We'd also then have the one office person, office manager, uh, admin assistant, whatever, who handles the munis aspects or the budgetary aspects back to the whole. So we're trying to say, where are our deficits, but how do we then make a team that can service more than one area? But we do have other deficits in other places. So it's, I'm not sure if we can pull it off, but I do know that technology and facilities are intricately linked the longer and the more developed we get, whether it's the medicine system that we talk about, whether it's even something like a school building event where technology plays a role because you need media and you still need physical labor of setting up tables. So that's what we're shooting for. Um, if it works, great. Um, the budgetary impact will not be a savings, but it will not necessarily be an addition either if we look within our departments and then we look to sort of restructure the earning position if we can. So when Jeff put this, just real quick, when Jeff put this on the agenda, we, I asked the question very similar to kind of the conversations we're having now. So the one thing I just want to make sure we're all clear on is, you know, I appreciate your efforts to find that person that has those skill sets. But if you don't, then I think mm -hmm. that's okay. Like, that, this, yep. you know, try it. We're looking. Right. And then, you know, you may have to have a conversation because I think we all recognize that when you're talking about someone that has some of the specialized knowledge on like mm -hmm. the facility side and on the technology, you may not find that person that has both. So, so yep. good idea that's to try exactly it, right. absolutely, rather than hiring two positions and now who are they managing to and just adding a lot of headcount. I, I fully support of where it's going, but don't put yourself in a box where nope. you feel like, well. We have to stick to this. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we said we were going to do this at that point just have the conversation this is us. the first yeah. step of a job description and a yeah. background maybe experience msba right school building yeah. project yeah. absolutely yeah no, there's, there's a lot there's a lot there okay where you want to go next draft calendar. of the calendar so in your pack you have a draft first draft of the calendar so we're looking at um where am i I'm looking here august 31st <laughs> is our first day of school teachers reporting in on the 29th we are still in contract negotiations with UNIDA and, and change the start date and days might affect this. But right now in your first draft, you're looking at August 31st for a start date for students with, a, with an end date for students on June 13th and a five snow days being June 21st. On your calendar, you see a yellow 16. That's a, that's a typo there. But five days would be June 21st with snow. Um, June 19th is a state holiday now. So we added that. Now, Chris and I received a letter. Chris received yeah. a letter from the town of Hanson today. Uh, if you want to read that. Letter. I'm not going to, so I won't read it, but the gist of it was, uh, it was a letter from the town clerk of Hanson uh, requesting that we consider uh, closing the schools for the state primary election on Tuesday, September 6th, and the state election on Tuesday, November 8th. So um, we, have the, we, we have the 8th already on the calendar. Well, the 8th is easy. Um, so that's just to take into account for consideration. Uh, that would bump us up another date, um, potentially. Make a long, nice long weekend, but, you know. And this is only an issue in Hanson. Only right. an issue in Hanson. Okay. Where do they vote in Whitman? Town Hall. Town Hall. Well, Mr. Chair? Yeah, Fred. Uh, I think traditionally we've done the same, you know, for Whitman as well. No, no, no. Sorry. I, so, yeah, Fred. Let me clarify the question. I, I'm not. I'm not advocating we only close the schools in Hanson. I was asking that the voting is only taking place in a Hanson school in Whitman. Right. I, wa I wasn't sure where they voted. So. If, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and I know that uh, uh, I, I won't say anything because I know we're in negotiations. Yep. <laughs> thanks, Fred. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thanks, Fred. So are we, you're thinking that on the next draft, we'll Yeah, well, honor it, that. I mean, again, think through that. We got that letter, I think, Michelle, we got the letter today. So we didn't add it to the, to the, to, to a reading item. Um, but they're requesting that, that day off for the primary. So, and that would affect the calendar. Yeah. 
<coughs> Bluntly, I don't like pushing out another day, but you know, the town, it is a town owned building and they do support us. So I know, but can I also say from an educator's point of view, it is very nerve wracking to have people in the building oh, in and out all day long. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's a, it's a security issue Absolutely. for no, sure. I agree with that too. Right? Parking lot traffic. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, like parking yep. lot. Somewhere else. <laughs> Find somewhere right. else to vote. Okay. okay. Mm. Excellent. Right, that uh, would be great. John, do you want to just talk about phones? The surplus, please finish up. <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, thank you. So um, we are putting out a request for proposals to uh, replace the phone system in, throughout the school district. Um, right now we've put the, the uh, proposal out um, with the idea that the vendor, whoever, whoever wins it, the successful bidder will take all the old phones and all the hardware, give it to us, and we'll store it. Um, what I'd like to at least you know, come before the school committee now and talk about is um, it, we could add an addendum that we could have where the, the vendor takes all that stuff and, and just, you know, gets rid of it uh, in any, any way that, that they could. Um, so it would, be, it would require you to um, vote the, the, the phones and the gear and the 20-year-old stuff and the old stuff that they're going to be pulling out when they put the new phones in. Um, that would be a vote to declare that surplus so then we would be able to give it to a vendor and have them get rid of it. Right now, the way it's written, they're going to give it to us. We're going to go store it somewhere until we decide what we can or can't do. No, get rid of it. So is this more just kind of giving us a heads up? And if you get to that point, you know, and you feel like it doesn't make sense to store it, there's no resale value, et cetera, you want to, at that point, declare it a surplus. You just come to us then with the specific listing of what it is. M most of the stuff is going to be old and unusable, but does it have any value? I, yeah. I don't know. I just don't know. Are you asking for us to vote it now, or are you asking us to vote it with a specific I, list? I wanted to bring it forward, and if you wanted to vote it as, okay. as um, to get rid of it, because right now the default we had to come out with the with the um, with the request for proposal. Right now the default is the vendor gives it all to us, and we store it here. So, like, I, if I understand you correctly, it's like we don't want to miss an opportunity to get rid of it for Great. nothing. <laughs> right? We don't want to store it. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to do you want to do I'll make a motion make a motion. Uh, make a motion that we give them the authority to get rid of all the phones when they the old the old equipment the successful bidder will be able to um, dispose to take possession of the all the phone equipment and dispose of appropriately yes. sounds wonderful yes yes thank okay. you any discussion uh, uh, mr chair yeah fred wouldn't we need a more detailed list as to what we're declaring surplus so that's what I did. That's I don't know, I that's what I don't, I don't know either. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable with just saying the old phones. Yeah, I mean it's up it's up to the committee. I think we can certainly delegate that to management if we so choose our administration, but we can also choose not to. So, Chris. Yeah, I think something like this is absolutely within the jurisdiction. You know, okay, we have we have the ultimate authority, but. I have no problem whatsoever letting a company we hire come in, determine what is no longer able to be used with our new system, and disposing of it. That's, that's pretty straightforward as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Any other feedback? Okay. Fred, anything else, or are we going to move to the vote? Uh, yeah, I mean, the committee's going to do what the committee's going to do, and I'm going to, you know, do what I need to do. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I understand. I think the, the reality is, you know, if they give us a list, unless we show up and sit next to them and make sure it's on the list, we're still, there's still an element of trust there. So <laughs> it's, I hope. it is, it is what it is, but. Okay. Okay. And everyone has their own problem. Yeah, absolutely. Problem. Absolutely. Um, all right. All right. Do you have a comment or you're ready to vote? No, I'm ready to vote. Steve's ready to vote. <laughs> okay. Steve, go ahead. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. Fred. Abstain. Okay. Mike. Yes. Beth. Yes. Chris. Okay. You got that, Michelle? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Whitman Middle, middle School building. Yeah. So, Fred, do you want to talk about Whitman Middle School or do you want me to? Uh, uh, or Beth or Chris? Here because I'm getting some feedback. Okay. Chris or Beth, do you want to add anything on the, from the middle school project? Uh, well, um, <laughs> we're meeting again next week 
Uh, we made a, a calendar appointment of every two weeks um, just in case we need it so that things can move along on a good state so that every two weeks we have a scheduled meeting um, starting next week. Um, we will be meeting with the company um, next week and we will start on choosing a group uh, to work with. Uh, Jeff is on, would be on it um, and I think, let me see, it was the chair, I mean, it was the business administration from, from Whitman mm -hmm. and uh, one school committee member and town representative, town. superintendent and or designee and a school committee member to choose the, the OPM is in the process of looking at our, our project designer. Is that is that what it's called, Fred? Yes. It, the yeah, it's yeah, and, uh, and I'll, I'll report out. Uh, so what we do is we, we approve the request for proposal. I knew it was uh, published. Oh. Well, to be sent to MSBA for their approval. Uh, they come back to us. We're in the process. It's very similar to the OPM where they have their boilerplate. And we'll be meeting next week just to iron that out completely so that we can place the ad at the central register and get going on uh, a designer. Now, the designer selection committee uh, is what that's called. It's for the designer selection. Jeff, you just said it. Uh, the superintendent, the business manager from Whitman, a town representative, and a uh, school committee member. No, we will it's vote that committee school formally at our next meeting. No, it's not. And then we're off to the races. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, Fred, it's a superintendent, and or designee, a town official, which could be the town administrator or selectman and one school committee member. That's allowed by MSBA, just three folks from our committee. Was it three or four? It's three. Okay. Thanks, Fred. Uh, yep. Facilities, anything to refer Facilities, we, we're meeting next week. We okay. couldn't meet today. Policy, Chris, anything Paul. further? Yep, so we met last week. Um, we had five items on the agenda, one of which we discussed tonight was the draft um, administrator's contract. Um, we followed up on the student dress code um, that Chris uh, had brought to our attention previously. Um, and uh, well, we're going to be looking at the district's uh, policy related to district's uh, administrator's coaching and um, athletic director's coaching. Again, this is done with our um, initial um, idea of looking into things that uh, affect uh, students. Um, in, in, you know, how do you want to say it? Like. Uh, have a major impact on, on, on students. I, I don't know how we worded it. Hillary, mm -hmm. do you remember how we said to do that? Just our our goals for the year. Yeah. Just like um, like impacting the students' experiences positively, right? So we talked a lot about the dress code. I'm just going to jump in for a minute. Sure. Um, we made sure, I know that there were concerns about it matching up in the handbook and our policy, so we made sure that's all set. Um, and then... Um, Dr. Jones was actually at our meeting and he talked about how he is working with the school council and students to talk about the dress code policy because we spent a lot of time looking at it and how it targets certain demographics of students um, and doesn't target others. Um, and so we kind of are going to go off of his lead. That's kind of how we left it where he's going to talk to school council. Um, and I thought it might be something that we could talk about with the student advisory committee mm -hmm. at some point. Um, just their thoughts on school dress code and things like that. Um, it was a good conversation. The dress code piece was good. So. Good. Good. Uh, negotiations, I'll take that one. So we've met several times and we have a couple more meetings coming up. Uh, I think the plan is we will do an executive session in March um, to give you an update in executive session. Uh, EC, ECE advisory, anything? Uh, David, do you want to speak to yesterday? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, the advisory committee met briefly yesterday. We uh, viewed our universal full day K presentation that we're going to present to the full committee. We run over any adjustments that needed to be made and uh, added some clarification. Uh, along with that, uh, Dr. Foley and the superintendent are meeting with Mr. Casey tomorrow at the Vol School to work on a video presentation. Um, after that's done, we're going to touch base and talk about other avenues of communicating and, and getting that outreach out there and uh, looking at that presentation and going from there and then also discussing when we're going to show the universal full day k presentation to the entire committee and nice. yeah that's where we're at 
Can I ask a question? Just because I feel like this date always sneaks up. So usually applications, I, I know that because full day K is on the docket, but uh, in my last four years experience, uh, usually uh, the, the kindergarten applications go out relatively soon. And um, is that so, so still a thing? I, yes, just, I just don't want so people it's, to it's, miss it. It's, if it's as is, the stuff is going out. What date is it? What is it, George? Do you in March sometime usually? Yeah, I, I want to say offhand, I think it's it. If you post it on the 15th and by March 9th, is uh, when that starts to go from there. Okay. But it'll be. Um, don't quote me on all of this, but I know that on the 15th, everything will be ready to be loaded on the website with all the further instructions, dates, and times. The embedded links, the information session, all of the things for what everybody needs to do. It'll stay status quo as it always has in the past. However, there'll be a caveat with what we're presenting in the budget, mm -hmm. and then the superintendent will have an FAQ to answer questions. But the reason why is it's always been right before last last three years was the this week, but now it's going to be for next week. And the reason being is that we wanted to make sure we presented the budget, gave some time for people to breathe breathe that in, and then go from there. And then we'll be able to accept applications for people. Um, on the week of February vacation because that benefits not only our registrar but that also benefits families because hopefully they'll be around. Okay. And then how do you, just want to follow up, how do you get that information out to, obviously if a family has students already in the school, I know that information comes out that way, but what sure. about families who don't have So the preschool the people will get their already packets because we asked them to sort of re-register already yep. and then we've, we've um, it'll be on Facebook, it'll be on um, paper. Our, web and we're going to put it in the newspaper also okay but the, the, the go-to date to get that information out is the 50. okay great thanks chris i don't know if i mentioned you talked about school choice as well did i mention that uh you didn't mention yeah. that but, i but you didn't but i did before yeah. school choice, so. yes you have some work to do thank you george uh before we get to the collaborative reports we should have put it on here but budget subcommittee um has met a couple times or sorry met earlier um, I think we had some really good discussion about the kind of the long-term planning and what some of that could look like. But I think in terms of us making recommendations or asked, we'll get through the budget meeting next week and then we can kind of, at the committee's pleasure, uh, determine how much time we want to spend in kind of looking at working on some of that planning going forward. So, but overall, I thought it was a, it was a good discussion earlier, unless David or Steve, you got anything to add, but overall, I think, think a lot. Yeah, yeah, it was a good I think I'll wait until too. after the budget. Yep. Yep. Um, Pilgrim Area Collaborative Report. Dave, got, anything you want to report so, out? So, um, because of my agency's um, protocols, I was not able to be on Zoom or attend the, um, the meeting last week for um, Plymouth Area Collaborative. I do know, though, and I don't know if it goes back to you, Chris, the, um, we did share the um, annual report, or at least I mentioned it verbally in one of our meetings. It's in our minutes, I think, from uh, last fall. Um, and, and I'm not sure if we had the annual audit already voted, so I, I don't know if I've even mentioned that. But it now seems that part of DESE, um, the school committee chairs, get this information, both the annual report and the annual audit. Um, so. I don't think anyone's being remiss. I think I've always brought it to you each year. Um, it's generally about the same time every year. Um, they are always put up on the website. Uh, Rebecca Haw, who does our um, executive um, secretary privileges, she has access to the website. And she's very good at um, downloading all those documents. So it's kind of a shared thing. Shared in the sense that I'm sure they're just giving it to Chris and other school committee chairs just so that they, they have it. But I'll always be sure to mention that. And I'll catch you up next month with what I may have missed this month. And just to clarify, we did get the Pilgrim Area Collaborative Report, and it is in the Google Drive. So for any of you that yes, do want right. to review that in detail, it is there. And the South Shore Collab Report is in the drive as well. And you have some reading items in your packet. <laughs> Nothing else to report. We had a good meeting. Excellent. All right. Mr. Chair? Yes, Fred. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, if I could have one moment to just thank all the folks, uh, and I know you included, uh, that jumped into the ocean. Well, <laughs> I don't know about the ocean. I'm sorry, in South Carolina, we're looking at the ocean. 
<laughs> oh, okay, tough one, Fred. <laughs> uh, and if I didn't have to travel, I would have been in there with you. <laughs> <laughs> no. It was cold. I, I, I do want to, you know, just personally thank the parents, uh, you know, uh, Alyssa Dillon, uh, Allison Dillon, mm -hmm. Alyssa, uh, that really worked their butts off. They raised an awful lot of money, over $15,000, I yes. heard. Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Yes. No. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Fred. It was, it was cold. I'm not sure it could get any colder. The ice was thick, but they cut. It was fun. Uh, and then, just in the spirit of equity, uh, you know, uh, we would certainly encourage PTOs, PACs from either town, if they're doing any type of event like this, feel free to send us a note. Feel free to come during public comment. Mm -hmm. um, any type of awareness we can build to support the schools in either town is is great. So. Hopefully it'll be warmer next year. All right, uh, motion to adjourn from anyone? Chris? Second. All right, roll call vote, Steve. Steve, uh, yes. Steve, no. <laughs> Steve? Yes. Mark. Michelle? Yes. God? Yes. David? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Fred? Yes. Mike? Yes. Beth? Yes. Chris? Yes. Awesome, all right, thank you. Have a good night, everyone. See you, Fred, safe travels. Thank you. Good night, thank good night. you.